all pediatric anesthesia cases. So today we have Nandini Madam <laughs> as an renowned pediatric anesthetist from Mumbai to discuss on this subject. And second topic is regional anesthesia in pediatrics. So you know, all of you know, the regional anesthesia is more popular in adult population, but not in pediatrics. Who is, who is it so? Is it is difficult to practice? We have a lot of questions in our mind about it. To discuss about it in details, we have internationally renowned pediatric anesthetist, Dr. Virsali Pandey with us. So today's session will be coordinated by Dr. Sarva Vinodini Veda. She will introduce the speakers. Over to you, Veda. Good morning, sir. Uh, morning, morning, everyone. It's nice to have you all here on a Sunday morning. Uh, I take privilege in welcoming Dr. Nandini Malai Dev, ma'am. She's a senior consultant and uh, head in SRCC Children's Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, she's an ex-professor and uh, head of the Department of Anesthesiology of Chem, Mumbai. And she's uh, the current vice president of National IAPA. And uh, she's a faculty for IAPA Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship also. She, uh, she's also an AHA certified instructor for uh, PALS, PPLS and all. And she has more than 100 publications of which 22 are our original research papers. And she's a joint editor of uh, many uh, of many chapters and books in various books and uh, she also has got so many fellowships to her credit uh, and her topic today is emergence delirium all that begins well should end well but we should always have the uh, we should always begin with the end in mind so the end can be catastrophic if it, if, if the if it is going to be an emergence delirium that is unmanageable at sometimes that can be damaging to the child to the attenders and to the healthcare people also. So, ma'am will now enlighten us upon emergence delirium. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Vinodhani, for that nice introduction. Shall I share screen? Yes, ma'am. Is my uh, screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am, visible, ma'am. Okay. okay. So thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you and happy Sunday. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction and thank you to Dr. Edward Johnson and the entire team at Online Anesthesia for this uh, invitation to meet with you and uh, you know have a discussion. Uh, it's truly a privilege. Uh, I was talking about how online anesthesia started during the pandemic and I think the pandemic has taught us so many lessons of you know how to cope and how to manage and a new way of learning. And it is pretty impressive how uh, you all have managed, uh, I think, 52 sessions in the last year and now uh, once a month. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, I'm going to be talking here about uh, emergence delirium after pediatric anesthesia, a very common problem. Uh, and let's see what's new in how to avoid it and how to manage it. I bring greetings from SRCC Children's Hospital. We are a 200 bedded tertiary children's care uh, facility in uh, South Mumbai, uh, managed by Narayana Health. So uh, we cover the entire spectrum of children's uh, uh, you know, problems. Uh, and from point of view of surgery, we have the entire uh, you know, spectrum of surgery, bringing from uh, you know, general pediatric surgery to orthopedics, uh, to complex uh, super specialty surgery, including cardiac, neuro, and also fetal interventions and uh, transplants. So practically everything uh, for children under one roof, that's where I come from. And uh, we have the one year IAPA fellowship as uh, Vinodhani uh, said, and we also have permission for the two year FNB, which has started this year. Uh, they've announced it this year and we have uh, permission for two candidates uh, for the FNB course run by the DNB board. So anybody who's interested is most welcome to uh, train at my institute. So before I begin, and I believe there are a lot of PGs here also, let us begin with a small uh, quiz question. And hopefully at the end of my talk, we will be very clear about what the answers would be. So which of the following statements is true about emergence delirium in children? The incidence is least in children one to five years of age. The threshold PEED score, which is the pediatric anesthesia emergence delirium score to diagnose ED is more than 10. The incidence is less with sevoflurane compared to desflurane. The incidence after inhalational anesthesia is less than 1%. So I leave you to think about the correct answer and meanwhile we'll move on. So let us look at a typical case, uh, just another ordinary day for me and Rishali and a lot of us. We have a three-year-old for circumcision. 
Now, these are typically daycare surgeries. Child will come in the morning, there will be no IV line, and we don't like to coke babies like that. So, typically, we would have given some pre medication. Uh, this child was very playful. He came with us into the OR, didn't miss his parents at all. So, we held the sevofluorine mask. We continued, uh, I mean, we took the IV under sevofluorine anesthesia and we continued the anesthetic with sevofluorine and LMA. For analgesia, we gave the penile block. Everything went uh, all right. 30 minutes, surgery was over. Patient is outside in the recovery room. And in the recovery, the child wakes up crying inconsolably. He's thrashing about, he's disoriented, he's creating a scene. Uh, what should have been done and what do we do now is a question. So what's going on? So clearly the child is agitated postoperatively and you're wondering what could have been the problem. Is it pain? Is it emergence delirium? Is it a temper tantrum? Because this is a typical three-year-old prone to, you know, uh, throwing a tantrum when he doesn't get what he wants. Preschooler cannot really verbalize that well what he wants. So, you know, it could be a temper tantrum you're thinking or is it something else altogether? So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, in the next, say, 40 minutes or so, I'm not going to take the full hour because I'm quite cognizant that it's a Sunday and it's also family time for all of us. So what I'm going to do in the next 40, 45 minutes is define what is emergence delirium, talk about the incidence, the risk factors, the causes of emergence delirium as we know it, how to prevent it, how to manage it, and some take-home points at the end. So emergence delirium is not a new thing. It's, it has been described by Eckenhoff and colleagues as far way back as 1960s as a disturbance in the child's awareness or attention to his, her environment with disorientation and perceptual alterations, including hypersensitivity to stimuli and hyperactive motor behavior in the immediate post-anesthesia period. So typically you'll have a child who's just out of the anesthetic, who's in the post-operative area, and he is... Uh, you know, having he's looking agitated, he may be thrashing around, he's inconsolable, whatever you do, he doesn't stop crying. Very uh, interestingly, they don't make eye contact, uh, they may not verbalize what they want, and uh, they are essentially creating a scene there. Almost 60 years later, we still have questions about what exactly is emergence delirium, how do we prevent it and how do we manage it? So it, it, is, a, it is a problem in pediatric anesthesia, especially so. A common synonym and a common terminology which is used interchangeably with emergence uh, delirium is emergence ag agitation. But agitation more so refers to a physical uh, you know, uh, problem. Like for example, the child, it may be more related to pain and anxiety than delirium itself, but more or less in all uh, uh, published literature, we can see these two terminologies, which are often used uh, for one or the other. So let's look at how big the problem is. Now, the incidence of uh, ED, as uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned, has been quoted with a very wide range, about 2% to 80% of all pediatric anesthetists, anesthetics. And the reason for this extremely wide uh, range for incidence may be because there is a confounding factor of pain. So what are the tools which the, you know, the researchers have used to measure uh, ED may be, uh, may be quite varied. And also how often they have tackled pain and then they have said, this is not pain, this is ED. So that's why we have a wide range. But by any uh, yardstick, at least about 30%, 20 to 30% incidence of ED is there in pediatric anesthesia. And typically the symptoms manifest on recovery of consciousness and last about 15 to 30 minutes. So if they last only 30 minutes, why do we worry so much about emergence delirium? What's the big deal? So off late or since the last decade or so, there has been a lot of focus on how the family perceives the anesthetic, the whole experience. So clearly, parents of children who've experienced emergence delirium uh, have, are quite distressed. It, it raises questions about the very quality of your anesthesia. So you may have done everything well, but at the end, if the child wakes up in this manner, it really raises doubts as to what you have done and whether you have done anything correctly. There is also a risk of self-injury because during that time, when the child is not completely in his senses. He may pull out lines, the IV lines may come out, rice tube, dressings, everything. So there is a definite risk of self-injury. 
So additional pers- uh, personnel are required to just restrain the child, see that it doesn't pull out, uh, you know, vital lines and tubes. It may add to increase medical care costs because you would be giving some, uh, you know, some medication to take care of the agitation, and then that may delay discharge. Also, interestingly, and more uh, uh, of concern to us, it's also the long-term psychological problems. So it may not be limited to just those 15 minutes or 30 minutes. These children have been shown to have increasing, uh, you know, you know, maladaptive behaviors, which may persist for as long as one or two weeks. So they may become, you know, extremely clingy. They may have, you know, new onset bedwetting, which was not there. And they may have, you know, disturbed sleep patterns or eating patterns, which can all have, you know, a long-term psychological consequences. So definitely we have to worry about ED and we have to do something to you know, prevent or manage it. So can you predict ED? So because if we were kind of, if we had the foresight that this child is going to develop ED, maybe we can do something about it before it actually manifests. So it turns out that you know, some certain procedures, for example, head and neck surgeries and also ENT and ophthalmologic surgery have got the highest incidence of uh, emergence delirium. And in general abdominal surgeries, it is urology which has got a higher preponderance. Now, uh, in the anesthetic technique, volatile uh, agents have got the highest incidence. Uh, all volatile agents can cause ED, but increasingly it is the agents with a faster wake up, like for example, sevoflurane or desflurane, which have got a higher incidence. Halothane doesn't seem to be uh, associated with an increased incidence of ED. Pain definitely is a causative factor, uh, but pain can also be a confounding factor. Uh, the The... I say it is only a confounding factor because even in procedures where there is no pain, for example, you have an MRI procedure for which you have used uh, sevoflurane, the patient can still have an emergence daily. But yes, it is a difficult, definite confounding factor and you must do everything to alleviate pain so that we can say, okay, this is not pain and this is probably emergence delirium. Patient trait plays a very, very important role. So it is a preschooler. The maximum peak is two to five years of age probably because they have never been separated from their parents and they are, they are all often in the confines of their home. Psychological immaturity, preoperative anxiety in the patient and in the parents. So you can look at families and you can tell, you know, if your parents are super anxious, usually the child is also anxious and you can kind of predict that this is, you know, going to be a problem for you in the postoperative period. The temperament of the child matters. So children who are emotionally labile, uh, children who are very clingy, who are kind of antisocial, these patients have got a higher incidence of uh, ED. Now, you must rule out certain physiologic conditions which can be confounders. For example, if a patient has got sepsis, he is hypoglycemic, if there is some electrolyte imbalance going on, hypoxia, hypercapnia, these can all be confounders. So before you say that this is emergence delirium, you must be very, very sure that you have ruled out other factors. A full bladder can sometimes cause problem in the perioperative period, postoperative period. A patient with raised ICP can behave in just the same manner as a patient who has ED would. So you must be very sure. I had a patient once who, uh, or rather more than once, who some children just won't stop crying until you take the IV out. So, so how do you differentiate it with just a temper tantrum or an emergence delirium? So the difference is that these children usually are very coherent. You know, they will point out to the IV line. They say they want it out. They are making eye contact. They're actually communicating to you and to the parents that this is a cause of anxiety or their agitation. So, so that's how you kind of can differentiate by ruling out all the other factors that this is nothing else but emergence delirium. So I cannot reiterate this more. Emergence delirium is a diagnosis of exclusion. So rule out pain, which is the commonest thing which will happen after surgery. Rule out other factors before you say that this is emergence delirium. So now what causes emergence delirium? So is it rapid emergence? Because we didn't see it in the days of ether or halothane. It could be a factor. Or is it emergence in the presence of surgical pain? So this again, there is a, a conflict here because you can have a patient who's undergone MRI, clearly no pain and still has emergence. Or you could have a drug, say like, for example, you manage with propofol and you still have emergence. So propofol has, so for example, propofol also has a rapid emergence, but the incidence of ED is less. So what, what I mean to say is probably not only rapid emergence, it is not the presence of surgical pain which causes ED. Clearly, it is multifactorial. 
probably what we are trying to uh, thinking to believe is uh, it is anesthetic agents which are acting on the immature nervous system and i say so because the incidence of ed is so high in the pediatric population whereas in adults or even in the uh, you know in the older uh, uh, geriatric populations the incidence is about 5% it could be preoperative demeanor and anxiety which is definite role on top of that you have anesthetic agents which are acting on the immature nervous system so this is probably what we think is causing ed now how do you measure it so it's important that you measure because then you would have robust objective evidence to say it is pediatric emergence delirium and nothing else so this is a standard peed score it's an acronym for pediatric anesthesia emergence delirium it's a five point score it is a validated score uh, uh, and it has thought these five elements which are rated from 4 to you know 0 and uh, it has got both elements of cognition and agitation so uh, the only limitation of this score is that again some elements are subjective and also it is quite time consuming so if you have a child who say who's thrashing about in the er the last thing you want to do is you know have somebody uh, you know uh, have it measure here and then then think about doing what to you know uh, do to you know manage it so an easier um, scale is a cravero scale again a five point scale but uh, simpler to measure and a score of more than 4 is suggestive of ed other scale which is validated is a vacha scale uh, a simple scale again rated from 0 to 4 and uh, so what is now believed is that you could you know if your child is behaving you know a little uh, agitated in the uh, in the post op what you could do is use the vacha scale quickly and then you could measure it more objectively with the peach scale so this is how you could you know Uh, optimize the use of scales so that you can actually have a measurable uh, a number and say it is pediatric emergence delirium and nothing else so how about prevention because uh, prevention is definitely better than uh, you know treating it so let's look at what is there in the literature and what what does what do all the reviews and the meta analysis say about uh, manage preventing ed so these are a whole list of strategies and this is a lovely article by uh, kera mason in bj to how you can decrease the uh, incidence of emergence delirium in children so top of the list is behavioral management how what volatile anesthetic you choose your choice of anesthetic technique and a whole list of medications which i will go into in detail acupuncture regional anesthesia and pain control so i i disagree with what uh, dr johnson had said at the beginning why we have two diverse topics today uh, regional anesthesia and uh, emergence delirium but turns out that there is a role of regional anesthesia in also preventing and managing uh, uh, you know preventing emergence delirium so let's look at each drug one by one midazolam now here the reports are extremely conflicting So there are studies to show that oral midazolam pre-medication does not prevent ED. Now, midazolam is one of the commonest pre-medication agents, which across the board all anesthetists use, whether they are doing only pediatric anesthesia or their occasional pediatric anesthetist. It's a you know commonly available agent. It has got uh, you know a, a shorter half-life. It is you can give it by the oral route. so it's very commonly used but turns out it doesn't prevent ed probably because the half life it peaks at about 15 minutes or so by you know by the oral route and by the time the anesthetic has ended probably the sedative action does not uh, you know persist into the post operative period that is why and also midazolam has got you know at least 30% of children will have a paradoxical reaction so it's not quite predictable you give it to cause anxiolysis but at the same time you know the children may not become uh, uh, you know anxiety free and they may actually have a paradoxical reaction so that's why you know it's not a great agent for prevention but there are also studies to show that a small dose of iv uh, midazolam has reduced ed in strabismus surgery So again, should we stop using midazolam? What is the this? So verdict is that because it's commonly used and because it has got some benefits in preventing anxiety and it's a very easily available pre-medicate, we can continue to use it. But at the same time, it it doesn't guarantee you that it will prevent uh, emergence delirium. It might cause anxiolysis in a large population. How about fentanyl? now again a single iv dose induction has reduced ed in short surgical procedures and this could be because of its uh, analgesic effect for sure uh remifentanil we don't have it yet but 
you know, when you have a combination of remifentanil and propofol infusion, that also has been studied and if there's a marked reduction in ED. So opioids per by and large seem to reduce ED and this could be predominantly because of their analgesic effect. What about propofol? Now, this is one drug which wins hands down, but it all depends upon the timing of administration. So if you have used propofol for induction only, there is no reduction in ED, probably because of the short half-life. But if you have used propofol as an infusion throughout the anesthetic, or if you have used volatile anesthetic, but the end, at the end you have given a dose of propofol, a small dose of propofol at the end of the surgery, there is a definite reduction in ED. So it all depends on how you use propofol. What about ketamine? Here there is a dichotomy. It seems to work. There are so many reports which are saying that propofol works. You could give it intranasal. You could give it uh, orally as a pre-medicant. You could give a single small dose at the end of surgery and it seems to work. Uh, but the concerns are it may prolong recovery and it may increase post-operative nausea vomiting. To me, I wouldn't use ketamine as my first drug because ketamine itself can cause a, 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 a kind of a reaction where it would, you know, your it could itself cause a reaction which is similar to emergency agitation, but it, it, there are reports showing it does work. So I wouldn't use it, but this is what the uh, reports are saying. What about clonidine and dexmedetone? So this is one class of drugs which reduces ED regardless of route and time of administration. So this should be your, there are systematic reviews, there are meta-analysis which show the beneficial effects of alpha agonists on post-operative behavior in children. So this is one class of drugs which win, which win hands down. So let's look at how you can give it, when you can do it and how it works. So nasal, uh, dexmed, uh, dexmed intranasal in doses as small as one and some groups have used even two microgram per kg has reduced ED. There are other benefits too. It reduces, it, it is, they're also analgesic. It reduces PONV, it reduces shivering. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, host of other benefits for alpha-2 agonists. There are groups which have used Dexmed as a bolus, continued with an infusion, and it has been found superior to fentanyl in reducing, in, uh, reducing ED. Or if you haven't used either of it, you haven't used it as an infusion throughout, but you can just give a small dose of Dexmed, uh, Dexmed just prior to extubation, and it is superior to propofol. What about magnesium sulfate? This is uh, this has been hailed as a super adjuvant, and we use it uh, of late for a host of reasons. And it has also been you uh, used for uh, preventing ED. So this is in again uh, adenotonsillectomy, where they've used a thirty milligram per kg bolus, followed by ten milligram per kg per hour, and it has reduced ED by fifty percent for the adenotonsillectomy. And mind you, many of the studies of ED in children has been in adenotonsillectomies because typically this is a surgery where there is a high incidence of uh, emergency delirium. There has been some uh, debate as, with, as to whether this has been because of the effect of magnesium in reducing post-operative pain. Nevertheless, there are reports that it seems to work. Pain control will regional blocks. Definitely reduces ED, probably because, again, you are removing the confounding factor of pain. And also, if you've added clonidine or dexmedetomidine to your blocks, then we know that alpha-2 agonists, by whichever route, will reduce ED. So probably that's the reason why regional blocks clearly win uh, for reducing ED. Gabapentin, prior to surgery, oral dose reduces uh, um, ED. And this is mostly used by us for major surgeries, older patients, say, for example, major spine surgery. This is where we would use typically gabapentin. I don't use it uh, that often for uh, emergency or delirium. We've been using it most of, mostly for chronic pain post-operatively. Melatonin, again, only an anxiol, uh, it's actually an, uh, just a you know sleep-inducing medicine, but oral melatonin also seems to work in reducing ED. I don't have any personal experience though. What about non-pharmacologic interventions? They seem to work. So acupuncture. Now this electrical stimulation of what is known as a heart seven acupuncture site, and I because I have no personal experience, I had to go up and see what it is. It's a site at the wrist, and it has been proven to uh, reduce emergence agitation in children. Again, behavioral distraction techniques to reduce anxiety clearly work. So, you know, there are papers, there are several, I just highlighted a couple, uh, video distraction. So basically, whatever you can do to reduce anxiety in the preoperative period. 
seems to reduce delirium in the post-operative period. So it, if it is video distraction, which works for the kid, if it is parental presence for the management of pre-operative anxiety, there are there are uh, places where they would take the parents into the pre-operative, uh, to the operating room and induce the child in the presence of the parents. This can be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, problematic if the parents themselves are anxious. So you really need to know the family and, uh, you know, see if the parents are anxious that it can actually translate to more anxiety in the during the induction. So, but if they are cooperative, they're okay, then it seems to work for the for redu reducing ED. Simple things like transport in a toy car. This seems to work for us. So if the child is okay, you put him in that car and you get him into the OR. Basically, do whatever it, you can do to reduce preoperative anxiety. And it seems to work for postoperative ED. Now, this is a... Uh, <clears throat> from the uh, Cochrane database, which looks at relative risk reduction for emergence delirium. And this is from what agent works best to least. For example, propofol as a single agent is best for ED. For, that means propofol for induction, continue the propofol as Tiva, and that's your relative risk is least for emergence delirium. Halothane as a single agent, but I'll not go too much into it because we're not, most of us are not using halothane. Propofol to maintain anesthesia after sevoflurane induction is inferior to propofol diva. So if you really want to reduce uh, ED risk, use propofol and stay away from sevoflurane altogether. What about adjunct agents? So top of the list is dexmedetomidine and fentanyl. Fentanyl here again, probably because we're taking care of pain. Chloridine also is a good agent. So basically, alpha-2 agonists and fentanyl are your go-to. And lower on the list are is, again here, propofol is lower only because it depends upon the timing. So either use propofol TIVA or use propofol at the end just before extubation, and then you can reduce your relative risk. What is clearly ineffective is oral, pre uh, oral uh, midazolam pre-medication and parental presence at emergence. So if you think that if a child is inconsolable and he's thrashing about, maybe getting the parents in will console him, that's not going to work. So what we do is because, because ED is so unpredictable, we do whatever we can to prevent it. But at the same time, there's no saying that, you know, with 100% guarantee that your child is not going to wake up, you know, uh, calm. So what we do is we ensure that, you know, the first 10 minutes when the child is in the uh, recovery, we don't get the parents in. Only when we are sure that the child is you know, not going to wake up in a kind of a delirious state, do we get the parents? Because once they come in and they see this kind of emergence, uh, you know, it can be pretty disastrous. Parents getting agitated. And it's not only that child and the parent, the neighboring child and the neighboring uh, family also gets agitated. And overall, it's a very, it's a very uh, unpleasant scene in your recovery area. So what are the non-pharmacological strategies? And I keep saying this again because this is, you know, uh, it's extremely important to use non-pharmacological strategies as well because then you uh, use less of your pharmacological strategies which may eventually delay discharge. So if you have the time and you have the uh, resources, you can, you know, work well in advance. So this is an advanced program which is mentioned in the books and I put it here as an acronym, but we can definitely use elements of these. It's it's You need a lot of people to, you know, kind of uh, have a program running, the psychologist, the child specialist, but even otherwise you can try, basically it's an acronym for anxiety reduction, distraction, which we can very easily do, video modeling, Adding parents provided they are calm. It's no point adding anxious parents to an anxious child and you know, having trouble for you. No excessive reassurance is extremely important. I always tell my uh, PGs, you know, you, two, three people talking and, you know, telling the child that nothing is going to happen. You know, the child is thinking something is definitely going to happen. So no excessive reassurance. Tell them exactly. It depends upon the age of the child, what you're going to tell them, in what language you're going to tell them and in what manner you're going to, uh, you know, kind of re uh, reassure them. But Tell, you know, things like, you know, they expect uh, to happen. Coaching, which means essentially training the parents and the family, if they are, you know, kind of uh, in a receptive sort of situation well in advance and uh, exposure. So basically, this is the advanced acronym. But essentially, preemptive education also helps. So if the parents know, if the child knows what he's going to expect, some short videos, if you have uh, ready to kind of, you know, go lead them through the whole process with the pre-op, the, you know, the intra-op and the post-operative period, it might help to reduce anxiety and thereby reduce uh, emergence delirium. So essentially reducing parental and child pre-operative anxiety works. 
how will you manage it so non pharmacological measures is mainly ensuring patient safety and then reassuring the parent that this is self limiting and uh, it is not going to you know last more than 15 minutes and we are going to give pharmacological rescue therapy which will you know terminate it right away so what has been listed as rescue is iv midazolam uh, interestingly propofol fentanyl and dexmedetomidine these are all small doses mind you you can look at the doses for me my go to would be either propofol or fentanyl simply because i am not very sure whether midazolam is going to work because we know there is a paradoxical reaction in a significant per- percentage of uh, patients if i have any doubt as to whether it is pain i would give fentanyl as my first drug if i'm very sure that i you know the child is not having pain because my regional has worked intraoperatively and there is no reason why he should have pain suddenly postoperatively then i would give propofol as my go to drug for rescue dexmedetomidine is a great agent but the only reason i don't put dexmed on top of my list is that you have to prepare it you have to you know it's a bit expensive and then you have to give only 0.3 you know mics per kg this should not be really familiar so you know opening an ampule a costly ampule and making it just for that is a reason why i wouldn't put dexmed to- on top but we have when you have say given a dexmed infusion intraoperatively or had dexmed ready for what some reason you could also give dexmed for our cleft palate surgeries very typically again high risk of emergence delirium what we do is we continue dexmed infusion throughout surgery we even take the uh, dexmed um, infusion pump post operatively and continue it if we feel that the child is waking up you know in a delirious state so uh, that's rescue for you now this is uh, everything put in a nutshell how we can prevent emergence delirium so first of all you identify patients at risk of ed so if your child is a preschooler in falling in that 2 to 5 years age group if there is a history of anxiety or a history of ed in the previous surgeries or the procedure is ent or ophthalmology then i would think okay this is ringing a bell this is a child with a high risk of emergence delirium so then you plan an anesthetic to reduce the risk of emergence delirium can you use can you use can you avoid rather sevoflurane altogether if the answer is yes then you plan for propofol based total intravenous anesthesia and you optimize strategies to reduce anxiety so you've talked to the family you use non pharmacological measures you use pharmacological measures and you also optimize post operative pain control using everything you have you can use regional use it if not then you can use opioids and sets to uh, optimum effect for some reason if you cannot avoid the use of sevoflurane then what you would use is any one of the adjunct medications with the inhalation anesthetic to Uh, reduce the incidence so you could use propofol at the end of the anesthetic you see, you could use dexmedetomidine infusion throughout the anesthetic or or use a small dose at the end you could premedicate with clonidine you could use fentanyl and other opioids and you could even use ketamine but i would still put it bottom of my list because i'm not very sure how it would work if your child has waking up and he's agitated in the uh, post operative uh, care unit first of all rule out hypoxemia hypotension because again this could lead lead to a clouding of consciousness your patient is irritable inconsolable not making eye contact not knowing what he is doing rule out upper airway obstruction because hypoxia again can cause something of a similar picture hypoglycemia again the child could be confused pain either surgical or non surgical once you've ruled out all these causes is when you make a diagnosis of ed again we know non purposeful agitation kicking absence of eye contact and absence of awareness of surroundings if you have the uh, the the you know the 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 peed score at your disposal you use it you can measure it so that helps and then treat emergence delirium again like i said propofol if you're sure it's not pain if you have a doubt fentanyl and then midazolam it will bottom of the list i my go to drugs again top two propofol and fentanyl So let me end with a case. Say you have a six-year-old with a previous history of ED, and he's scheduled for a tonsillectomy. So again, here red flags. This is a six-year-old. He has got a previous history of ED. He's scheduled for a surgery which has got a high risk for tonsillect or uh, for ED. So how would you proceed with anesthesia? Would I have uh, any of the PG's answer? Is it possible, Doctor uh, Johnson? PG's can post their answers in the chat box. Oh, have okay. 
Shall I wait for the answers in the chat? So six year old, anxious, anxious parents, previous bad ED, and scheduled for a surgery which has got a very high incidence of emergency delirium. Somebody said, Madam, that the English agent, I will use English agent to work for them. Okay. I would say that's, that's asking for trouble, but uh, okay. So does he mean that he will use it for induction? Yes. Praveen Kumar, so will you use it for induction or will you use it throughout the case for induction? Okay, but the child is not coming in. Child is very anxious, parents are super anxious. How are you going to get the child in? I, I'm presuming you're thinking, okay, we don't have an IV line in place because the child let, won't let you go near him. Somebody posted in YouTube that is, I would like to use Dexmed in. Okay, how? How are you going to get the Dexmed in? Is it pre medication? Is it going, are you going to use it intraoperatively at the end of the case? How are you going to approach this child? This child has come into your, he's not even coming into your pre operative area, he's running away from there. He is posted, uh, I will go for a pre op counseling as well. Fantastic. Okay. Pre-op counseling. Pre-op counseling is kind of working because, you know, last time also they had pre-op counseling and still had very bad ED. So there's a lot, lack of trust here. Parents are super, super anxious. Only child. Clingy. Extremely pampered. Any other answers? How would you get the child to your pre-operative area? How would you let him even accept a... Are you planning, if you're planning inhalation induction, how will he, how is he going to accept the mask? And he's a six-year-old, good weight, 25-30 kg child. Are you going to pin him down and put that mask on? Any other answers? How are you going to get that mask on? Okay, you'll use sevoflurin. Somebody posted a ketamine in IM1. Oh. Intramuscular ketamine. Mm. So most of us pediatric anesthetists, we actually shy away from using intramuscular injection. That will be a last resort. You know, any kinder ways? Okay, somebody is... Intranasal dexmet or uh, midas, oral midas as pre -med and then proceed. Okay. Oral midazolam. Uh, yeah, or an intranasal. Intranasal? Dexmet. Dexmed. Okay. If so not, can, will. Yeah, absolutely. So oral midazolam in a little older child, no, I would be a little wary. And again, 30% of children will not have anxiolysis. They may have paradoxal agitation. What is to say that your child is not in this 30%? So I want to use one medication which will sure short work. So my go-to, okay, let me see the other answers before giving the parental presence at interval. Oh, super anxious parents. Parents are only very, very anxious. This may work, you know, be counterproductive. Intranasal Dexmed, one microgram per kg. Fair enough. Showing video, mobile use. This child doesn't want to see anything video. He just wants to go home. Any other, uh, this thing? Any other uh, answers or shall I go on? Uh, shall I? Ketamine. Intramuscular ketamine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Intranasal ketamine, okay. Hmm. The child to hold, to hold with any parents. Sorry, sir. What did you say? The child to let the child to hold the parents. Child should hold the parents. <laughs> okay. So thank you everyone for all those responses. So let me see. Let me see. I my answer may not the most be the most ideal. Huh? You can have your differences because everyone uh, has a different way of doing things. But let me see how I would. Uh, let me see how I would. Huh. So I, I agree. One one response preoperative anxiety management. I would definitely ensure a good pre anesthetic check. So uh, this is where you know our uh, fellows usually give us a good heads up. They will go. They will see. They are usually the first point of contact, and they'll give put on the group. You know, super anxious parents. 
fussy child so that itself gives us a idea so here again with the previous history of ed child is very you know hyper uh, we would do a good pac so here is a time where you can counsel you can talk to parents you can talk to the child uh, definitely it might go a small way in reducing the anxiety and sedative pre medication for sure this child you no know, because uh, again my go to will be either intranasal dexmed or oral clonidine now oral clonidine can delay discharge but this is a child i'm not really worried about you know discharge it's okay let him stay a little later i'm okay but i want to prevent uh, you know another uh, emergence delirium and they had a bad uh, anesthetic earlier it's okay if he can stay in i would go with poor, uh, oral clonidine simply because it is tasteless and usually children who are fasting you know they will be okay to take uh, that uh, oral this thing we do it for our autistic children who will otherwise not uh, you know uh, manage with anything they may not spit, they may spit out other things but a tasteless clear clear liquid no like uh, you just give clonidine in water they will usually take but if the child is okay to take dexmed intranasally that is another very good option some child will you know i had a child coming to me who will come like this we ran around that child for 45 minutes trying to convince her to take intranasal dexmed and this was a child who had come for extraction of one two teeth 10 year old perfectly normal child probably had some bad experience before and she was like this how do you put intranasal dexmed so here if you have counseled the child or maybe the talk to the parents also you just sneak in that you know say sips of water you can give up to two hours you know so one hour before you give that clonidine with the so you would do it in the room before the child even comes to the preoperative age so this is one way of doing it and again i would use tiva because i know this is a problem uh, this is going to be a problem i would avoid sleep so i will induce of course now here if i have given this pre med child will hopefully take the mask nicely induce with sevoflurin sometimes some children even will allow iv line so it depends you know the good iv you can take in the pre op only you can put prilox the child doesn't you know it doesn't hurt when putting the iv but the child is not happy with that prilox and iv you can just uh, do it under a sevo fluorin take the vein in and do it totally under propofol i would ensure that pain is taken care of now in adenotonsillectomy pain can be quite you know difficult to take care of that sore throat and all it's quite uh, problematic so use multimodal analgesia fentanyl diclofenac paracetamol magnesium local anesthesia as a surgeon to spray the fossa with uh, buprenorphine and allow recovery in a quiet environment so this is how i would manage my case any further thoughts on chat should i look it up how to prepare oral clonidine is a question so basically we have the ampule no which we use for your regional and all it's the same thing so it is um, uh, 150 mic uh, ampule comes and you just use it to 3 3 mics per kg is what we give okay you should to see answer your question madam that is 6 year old how to manage in ed there is he will go for a video game dragon video game in the pre operative Okay. Okay. And Narayan okay. Paliwal has answered in the international next kit. Next kit. It's only two hundred and ninety. Yeah, a lot of people are using Dex kit. I personally don't feel the need to combine, but it's okay. I suppose if it works for it works. That also is a good option, I suppose. Uh, coming to coming to our question. Now we have finished the presentation. We will take up the questions in the last. okay fine so this is the last slide actually so uh, coming back to our quiz question what is true about emergence delirium in children the, uh, the incidence is least in children is uh, obviously false it is maximum in this age group threshold peds score to diagnose ed is more than 10 is the correct answer incidence is less with sevoflurin compared to desflurin there is no difference it is equal between sevoflurin and desflurin and the incidence after inhalational anesthesia is less than 1% is clearly false so in summary ED is common between children uh, in the group of uh, two to six years or so. The occurrence can be reduced by adopting a low ED anesthetic technique. ED, yeah. mind you, is a diagnosis of exclusion, and the most effective regimen includes anxiety reduction preoperatively, alpha two agonists, and propofol. These are my references. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for the wonderful presentation. Then we will take up the questions in the chat. Box. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nandini ma'am, for that wonderful and interactive session, and uh, making us all realize that ED is not just that fifteen thirty one it's uh, issue. It can have long term effects also, and it can it can uh, be deleterious for the child and for other people 
and for the surrounding children also not just for that particular child and uh, just few clarifications or few more points if you if you want to emphasize on uh, the the question on like how clonidine has to be prepared again that question was asked again ma'am just if you can repeat I so think. chlorine comes in an ampule, no? It is one fifty one fifty micro. Uh, so in that ampule, so you just take it. You know, we it take it in one ml syringe, so that we know exactly how much. Say your child is thirty kg, you want to give three mics per kg. So we'll take like that, and you will put it in a glass. We usually put it in a glass. Put some water also, so then tell the child you can take sips of water. And yes. chlorine, but you have to give one hour minimum. You have to give one hour. So what we do is, woman, child has got admitted, no? We would have done all that preparation. Sister has to tell us child has got admitted, and we will go there and give, and then shift the child after one hour to the recovery. You know, I think Dr. Bhuvanesh should have got the answer. No, they asked for, yeah. and uh, how do you give intranasal dexmet? It is again using that nasal atomizer. No, no, we don't have a nasal atomizer. Uh, although one ml syringe, just one ml syringe, squirt it, you know, and it is such a small volume that the children will uh, allow. Mostly, you know, they're used to that otrivin drops. Yeah, the moisture drops and also they will tell. And some, very often we tell parents only. Okay. We are just cleaning the nose and all, and parents will put the drops and again. Fifteen to thirty minutes. Fifteen to thirty minutes. Hour, hour, to 30 minutes yeah. But again, it's a sure shot. It will work. Yeah. One to four, one to three mics per kg around. I give only about one to two mics per kg. Okay. Uh, intranasal dexmet alone as an uh, as an agent for uh, like Nora for uh, pediatric MRI and all. There have been publications like that also. Uh, yes. So it you can so if there is no contrast or anything planned, then you probably can get away with only that. But it all depends. You know, sometimes you do that and then they uh, also prefer to take an IV line in case you have to give something, you know. So that way. Okay. And uh, the uh, off late, there has been a lot of incidents of uh, emergence delirium, mainly because of the agents uh, that we use, the sevoflurane, which was not there before, uh, as you had rightly pointed out, was it was not there when we used ether and all. Uh, that was mainly because of the differential uh, breath gas solubilities and the rapid recovery. Uh, the rapid recovery is because of some differential areas of recovery in brain also, like uh, the parietal cortex recovers faster than your cortical Functions so like the auditory function recovers fast and there's no integration mostly in children so that is the reason like the different areas getting recovered at a di different pace and the auditory recovers fast but the way the prefrontal area recovers slow and they aren't able to integrate the senses which the inputs that they receive so absolutely uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask if that is then you said it so beautifully I'm just listening nice <laughs> that is actually the so the auditory senses recover fa first faster. And probably in the child, because of the immature synapses, immature, yeah. works, you know, there is a sort of uh, imbalance there between. So, like, uh, if, if we start with sevoflurane and then if we go on to continue the, the anesthetic with isoflurane, uh, is it the same as, like, starting with sevo uh, and uh, going on with the... So, all inhalational agents will cause ED, with the exception of halothane. So, even isoflurane can cause. Okay. So if you really want to prevent ED, then you have to do something else, like you no, know, so propofol at the end, dexmed at the end, something like that. Yes, and uh, Madam, is there any long-term consequence of ED? Is there what long-term long consequences? I think, uh, ma'am. So, told so it they say that it is not as self-limiting as it is, you know, believed to be. So up to two weeks, uh, children have had these maladaptive behaviors and all, you know, they will become clingy, they can have a new onset, a new resist, they may have temper tantrums, they may have, you know, uh, you know, eating issues, sleep issues, things like that. And we, and I think overall, uh, even though maybe more than two weeks, they've not talked about it, we don't know, honestly. But at the same time, there is such a bad, uh, this thing about the anesthetic, the next time the child or the family comes for some surgery, they are going to, you know, remember this. So overall, your whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, experience of anesthesia is not going to be a good one. Thank you. And, uh, uh,
Any other questions? Like bioavailability of buccal is more. ऑप्शन Uh, in the management of ED, that single shot of propofol is enough to manage that uh, episode of ED, ma'am. Yes. Or do we need yes. to repeat it after some time? No, no. Usually, no. Just one milligram per kg propofol, and uh, that takes care of it. Probably because that will work at least for fifteen twenty minutes. No, and ED is so that is the time usually. That is the time. Thank you so That's much, ma'am. Thank you for. Is there any way to safely induce with the inhalation agent other than sevoflurane to avoid ED? If you have to induce with an inhalation agent, it is only sevoflurane. No, we don't have an uh, option. Uh, we can uh, give propofol and reduce the dose of sevoflurane like that. Any during under- induction? During induction, I'm uh, so if you're inducing with sevoflurane, I believe you may not have an. Don't IV. have an IV line. That is why you're inducing. But even if you have to induce with sevoflurane, which most of our inductions are like that only, because most of the times child may not have an IV, especially for all these daycare surgeries. So we do induce with a uh, sevoflurane, but we have everything else to take care of ED. So ED can be really actually we can you know predict if you are doing only pediatric anesthesia by because you have learned you burnt your fingers so long, so often that you know you can predict and you can kind of prevent. So most of us, what we will do is at the end of the anesthetic, we give propofol always one milligram per kg, whether we think patient is high risk or not. Most of our two two to six year olds are high risk, so we will give that small dose of propofol, and we don't really want them completely awake. We are happy that they are breathing, maintaining reflexes when we take out the tube or the LMA or whatever. Mocha or doka ice cubes by Dr. Tushar Choshki. Oh, I don't know what this. I don't is. know what it is, ma'am. I I think it's metazolam, ketamam. I don't know what. Oka is a preparation of two subjects. Of metazolam, metazolam, oral ketamam. I think metazolam, oral ketamam. What is the A? I don't. Acetaminophen. Acetaminophen. Doctor Tusha, can you explain what it is? Is it metazolam, ketamam, and acetaminophen? Okay, I want to highlight two things. When I'm inducing an inhalation agent, I am uh, having my friends, pediatric anesthesiologists from USA, and he has suggested one thing that uh, how they are doing induction with sevoflurane anesthesia. They have a dragon game for sevo dragon anesthesia. When the child is in the recovery room and they are playing the video game, where the dragon is inhaling and exhaling in the video screen, and at the same time the child is uh, instructed to inhale and exhale in the same in the mask, but that mask is containing sevo. Furen. So the child is properly uh, instructed that ke, how dragon is inhaling and exhaling that uh, in the video screen. You have to do this exercise, and within three to four breaths, the child is coming under the anesthesia. So that are following in so many uh, pediatric department of anesthesia in all over the country in USA, and that I liked it. But it is not available in India. And second thing in my practice since last twenty years, I am following Moka Ice Cube in my all ENT surgeries where the tonsillectomy and another pediatric anesthesia where I prepare ice cube of uh, ketamine, midazolam, ondansetron, ondansetron and atropine mix, and I give it to up to two years, more than two years to fifteen years of old child at the dose of one ice cube, two ice cube, three ice cube, and I am comfortably my child is uh, sleeping. At least they will be. uh distracted from their parents and they can be put iv line so this oral ketamine and midazolam works very well child is not able to take at least oral suspension but so that's why i develop a moka ice cube so ice cubes are very good co- combinations of this and uh, in my practice almost all the patients i am doing with one hour before this moka ice cubes and i am comfortable even i can it's a pre medic pre pre medication novel pre medication before going to anesthesia and now i have uh, change over from midazolam to dexmedetomidine so in that part my child is comfortable and i have to give little bit dexmedetomidine or propofol or ketamine to induce that patient for tonsillectomy or any uh, urological surgery or something like that so in pediatric anesthesia i want to highlight the oral preparation of other agents that's the way 
okay how do you prepare that uh, like what dosage how much you prepare in one uh, that is the I same dose. Is how much? that is the same dose we are doing in the oral preparation like ketamine we are using 5 to 10 mg per kg then dexamethasone if we are using then 1 mg per kg and naturally midazolam 0.1 mg per kg then other things on den setron all these preparations are available orally and we can use from even injections to prepare ice cubes and for palatable purpose i am using sometimes the uh, orange juice or something like sugar juice to add and uh, more than 500 patients i have completed and mm. now since last year i have switched even this works very well in the nora situation and also when there is a small things are going on patient should not be given uh, full anesthesia but just uh, heavy sedation that's all and uh, in that part also the uh, hemodynamic stable st status is stable thank you thank you thank, thank you so much sir thank you for your contribution thank you, you do so publish uh, I, I, yeah, I have. Uh, this is available in the net also. This paper. Thank you, Tusha, for your contribution. Thank you, thank you. Oh, this is so Nandini. Thank you, thank you, Nandini, ma'am, for that interactive session. Thank for you for making us all uh, realize the importance of emergency agitation and delirium and the ways to tackle it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, ma'am. We'll go to the second session. I call upon Dr. Vrishali Ponde, ma'am. She is the director of Children's Anesthesia Services, Mumbai. She is the program head of WS WFSA Children's Anesthesia Services and the IAC Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Fellowship, Mumbai. Uh, she is in the education committee of WFSA Pediatric Anesthesia, and uh, she is an ex-president of Academy of Regional Anesthesia. She has many honors. Uh, and she, uh, and she is part of the AORA and the CAS Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Fellowship program. She works as a regional anesthesiologist and a pediatric anesthesiologist in various institutions in Mumbai, and she has got uh, so many publications to her name, around eighty-five international and national research publications. And uh, she is uh, she is an author of the book Illustrated Manual Ultrasound Guided Regional Anesthesia in Adults and Children. It's been translated in Japanese language also, and she has represented India in various regional anesthesia perspectives. So she will be the best person to speak on the pediatric regional anesthesia. Over to you, ma'am. And she also is a good sitar player. So hope we can hear from her regarding sitar also sometime later. Over to you, ma'am. Well, namaste and an extremely joyous morning to all of you. And uh, Vinodini, I'm almost beholden to you. What a fantastic introduction you did! Thank you so much. Well, now let's get along with the topic here. I am trying to share my screen. Uh, can everybody see the presentation? Yes, ma'am. Your voice alone seems a bit lower, oh. ma'am. Can you increase your voice? Now am I heard? Yeah, yeah, fine, fine, fine. Better, fine. better. Yeah, yeah. Clear, clear, clear. Loud and clear. Uh, okay, okay. All right. Now, what I am trying to do is I am trying to see my own slides. You can see these slides. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, we can. can we can see slides now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. So yes, I take the baton of pediatric anesthesia ahead. We come to another important um, factor that is almost intertwined today with pediatric anesthesia, and such which is pediatric regional anesthesia. Uh, yes, it has kind of formed its own niche and its own way of teaching, and it comes of of course after having the basics of pediatric regional anesthesia founded extremely well. So let's go ahead and spend some good time, and I'm so so delighted that for once we have forty five minutes given to a pediatric topic because the moment we start. In a regional anesthesia work uh, as such, pediatric anesthesia would be regional anesthesia would be given some. Point and we need to cover everything in that particular twenty minutes. So I, I actually I am going to enjoy myself, and I hope you all do along with me. So you know, I want to share one of my patients' uh, WhatsApp with you with her own consent, of course. So prior to that, I want to say something. We all are anesthesiologists here. There are PG students as well. Remember, if you, if we all live as much as we are expected to live and work around. Uh, say eight hours a day. We spend around eighty thousand working hours in our lifetime. Um, well, if you want to add a good meaning to it and 
truly have fun doing what you do i guess we need to really like what we want to do we and 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 just not like and remain there but see how much we can evolve and be our best when we give our patients whatever we can offer so this is a small whatsapp that i want to share to begin with just so that we energize ourselves to look into something even better than what we could do and we all are together into this so she she said that dear dr pounde my son was undergoing a minor surgery and my pediatrician was very keen to set an appointment for surgery based on your availability well i was in cloud 9 when i read that because in private practice it's the other way around as he said you are best with kids because we love kids and that's indeed is true so it was very nice of a, of that pediatrician tells how much team work goes in because regional anesthesia is not just in the or it has to go to the pediatrician the neonatologist the picu the surgical team and of course the parents they all are have to be in your team she further added my son was so comfortable with your presence itself yes nandini said go reassure first of all one eyeball and you're going to come to know the family what they would want from you give the information as much as it is required even as far as regional anesthesia goes so don't come up with don't overwhelm them don't i mean just be on natural and be calm yourself so that you can percolate that 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 calmness in them so uh, and listen to them i guess i guess if you are very patient and listen to them you come to know all that is expected uh, from them as in as in terms of behavior and they need to know what to expect from us so my son was so comfortable with your presence itself that made everything else so easy and thank you dr prashali for looking after my child so carefully as i understand how important the effect of anesthesia is during a surgery thank god and i mean she wrote this to me um, well there was a reason why i have posted this here the pgs are here i was told go home and reflect on this because uh, you it, it will never never happen that you don't do work to get a reward but if you do good work and have and enjoy it yourself and see to it that you're pleasant around um, all this becomes a bike product and by the way just on a on, on a a lighter note she is mrs popley and she is she owns a big jewelry chain here in mumbai so my declarations to begin with us yes i am biased towards the subject that i am being told to speak on and i have the conflict of interest with those who don't think that regional anesthesia and pediatrics is important and i like movies we will come to that why so the agenda is going to be as follows why pediatric regional anesthesia why am i given 45 minutes to an hour on a sunday morning what are the fundamentals of ra no let's not go to the blocks let, let's first understand this what are the must know everyday blocks because there are certain occasional pediatric anesthesiologists and what are the cutting edges for those who are practicing in day in and out what are the complications and controversies nothing no astute decision can be made unless you are aware of complications and controversies given to in for a given topic and the take homes that we can take on this coming to benefits of regional anesthesia this staring at you but this article is extremely elaborate in uh, telling you the benefits of a uh, regional anesthesia as such it's written by professor bosenberg and it's it the pdf is free to be downloaded so yes you can all read let me however give you the gist of it it's safe we you, you know what the magic here is unlike adults pediatric regional anesthesia is given in either a sleep or a general anesthetized patients as such and yet it is safe so yes there is a there is an inherent safety factor here whereas the adult work is world is like still contemplating whether we need to give sedation or how safe are they to be given under general anesthesia especially the neck blocks so well this is how it is here we've rested the case long back for obvious reasons then pain relief of course obvious reason reduction in anesthesia requirement ga sparing in a um, in an atmosphere where now we are talking about general anesthesia having detrimental effects on a newborn brain or a immature brain 
this has come forth in a very different perspective. Physiological benefits, we shall look into them. Post-defense mechanisms are better. And economy, of course, yes, we let go of so many other things. Or And of course, you spare GA, you spare some money as well. And local anesthetics and a needle. And perhaps one-time ultrasound machine. It, it goes a long way. We've proved it by a proper study that, yes, it is economical. So let's come to physiological benefits. Yes, there is analgesia and the benefits of analgesia itself reduce need for post-operative ventilatory support. They get weaned a little early because you give them analgesia by giving continuous catheters, hemodynamic stability, very inherent again, and reduced hormonal stress response because there is no surgical response as such. And then redu reduction in intraoperative blood loss. There is a hypovasculature. The, I mean, a hypovascular field is very, very typical of a good regional block. A, an astute surgeon who's worked a lot on either side shall tell you that. Well, let's come to basic principles of pediatric regional anesthesia and let's build our foundations right from here. There are certain there are certain differences in anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology of neonates, children, and adults that needs to be you know, synced into us to pick up pediatric regional anesthesia and work ahead. So let me just go through them. Let's look at myelination, what happens in neonates, children, adult, but let's not look at that. Let's look at the clinical implications of it as well. Myelinations in neonates, very immature in child, well, it's completed till 10, but remains immature. In adults, the myelination is complete. So what are the clinical um, implications of it? Well, Clinical implications are LA rapidly penetrates into the nerves, producing fast onset block. A low concentration is what is required for a dense block. So just remember this. And now let's come to endoneurium. Loose, loose in neonates in children and relatively firm in adults. Greater spread of LA produces a fast onset and high quality block. LA is absorbed quickly away. So in nutshell, we get real solid blocks in low concentrations, the, the onset is fast and always the recovery is fast as well. Vasculature surrounding nerves, there are rich vasculatures in smaller age groups and less vasculature in, I mean, they're less vascular around in um, adults and even lesser in geriatric population. Age-related differences, mind you, this is something that we really need to understand, especially for the central neuroaxial blocks, the termination of conus medullaris. We all think of dural sac more and conus medullaris less, but if you want to practice spinals, we need to do a, a close thought on conus medullaris in neonates L3 and L4 or L4, and for till one year, L1, and in adults, yes, of L1. Termination of dural sac, again, very important. S3 or S4 in neonates, ascends a bit. S2 in till one year, and then S2, it remains in adults that way. Well, curvatures, let me tell you the nutshell of this. Curvature, as the in neonates, it's straight. As the child starts walking, you get the lordosis. But prior to that, the cervical curvature gets established because the child starts lifting his head as it were. So cervical first, lordosis then, and then of course, the, it, it, it's thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis is present in adults by that time. What are the clinical implications of this? In neonates, caudal can become a portal to two thread your catheters up to the thorax or increase the volume, reduce the concentration, and then you, you take the amount of local anesthetic and expect it to reach till the thoracic level. Not in older children because the lumbar lordosis is going to sink your local anesthetic right there and you're not going to get lower thoracic, neither higher thoracic from the caudal portal as they grow. Vertebra cartilagin is later on, they ossify. Ultrasound windows, very open here. Sacral vertebrae, incomplete fusion. Caudal, portal, open for you. One year, it re it's still open, but definitely by seven to eight years, it's closed by fibrosis, but not impossible to really look into uh, it, palpate it, and go with a needle inside. But however, the blocks can be patchy here. So let it, it, you know, I know the slide is busy, but what we can do is we need to understand how all this has 
has changed our ways of performing blocks because say in neonates there is a higher risk of dural puncture because we know that the that the dura is lower down in all age groups surface landmarks influence the level of needle insertion now we know where the conus medullaris is in adolescents and adults a steeper needle angle is required whereas in neonates just go straight especially at least when you are going to lower thoracic uh, levels in infants and neonates there is an increase in cephalarch spread, spread that i already told you and lordosis limits it in neonates and infants sharp needles may traverse into bones remember this and damaging ossify ossification nuclei something that matters to us there and then on table the sacrum of a neonate in infant is going to be so supple that for a person who is too used to the ligamentum flavum of an adult or a school going child it's not going to be any different and the local calculated for cord for a caudal epidural now can go into the intraosseous uh, plane of be which is just beyond the sacral bone and now you are going to convert an intravascular injection there is hardly any difference between intraosseous and intravascular injection here so so that's that is the importance to know what happens to the cartilages so short bevel blunt tip needle hence are better neonates and infants there is a better ultrasound visualization of course and sacral hiatus as a portal is available only till 8 years or 7 maybe then sacral epidural approaches are possible until complete fusion as well so let's see how this goes now drugs and dosages it's extremely important here well i know again there are two three columns just remember one thing for peripheral blocks 0.5 ml per kilogram of 0.25% levobupivacaine or bupivacaine or 0.2% tropivacaine always safe when it comes to caudal we need to go by ml per kilogram depending upon where we need to reach with it we'll come to that once we start the dealing with the central neuroaxis coming to common adjuvants the list again is long but in practice we just pick up one clonidine 0.5 to 2 micrograms per kilogram so this is that one drug that we would pick up if we need to give um adjectives and adjectives are always welcome anything that prolongs analgesia is welcome so deep calculations are required here so which are the everyday blocks as it were and which are the real cutting edge blocks that you can hone your skills as you are done with the basic blocks as such Well, let's come to the central neuroaxial blocks. We'll go to the upper extremity, lower extremity, trunk, penile, and ring, and then let's come to the uh, latest blocks as, as such. Coming to caudal, there are three things about caudal. Well, there it's simple. It's simple. It's simple. It's simplicity of the caudal that has really kept it going till now, and I guess it's here to stay. Simply because it is simple to give. It picks up huge number of indications right from the toe. till the lower thorax it can clearly be a very very uh, versatile block to give it can be given as loss of resistance it can be given as pns loss of resistance would be palpate posterior superior iliac spine and then one finger try and make a so called isosceles triangle arguably palpate the sacral hiatus and then get in with an either a hypodermic needle or a pns needle and then get going with a uh, stimulus here and then motor response is perianal twitch now let us let, let us spend some time on this particular video as such and let us understand why should one ever take any trouble of going through this particular modality for a simple caudal which we claim is actually a very very simple block well now you take a hypodermic needle you once we traverse from the insertion point inside skin subcutaneous tissue get a give of sacrococcygeal membrane as such yes of course that this a, a very objective um phenomenon no that's a subjective phenomenon depends upon the expertise of the person who's giving it depends upon how many blocks he has given before however still remains an extremely uh, easy technique to do extremely easy thing to actually perceive you start giving you see a bulge there so we know that in, we are in the skin and subcutaneous tissue so if you really want to be very sure that your needle is amidst the phylum terminal and at an objectivity to it 
pick up a PNS needle. How would you use it? Yes, activate your PNS circuit, but but be at higher currents. How? Four to five milliampers, and then get going in it. Once, or you could actually get the give with the PNS needle and then on the current, go to higher currents. At lower currents, you're not going to get. At three to five, you get that, elicit the end motor response. You might see even the toes moving around. Toes could be also end motor responses. What information have we got? We have we are very clear that we are in the phylum terminal for sure amidst the roots of it. Okay. Now what, what additional information can we get? Now reduce the current. If you start getting um, it as low as a 0.3 or 0.4, which we are so conditioned to look at when it comes to peripheral ner peripheral nerve blocks. If it happens, be sure you have gone through the dural sac and the tip is sitting inside the CSF. So this is one way of being very sure that you're not going to create complications at least. If somebody wants to do that, yes, it is most welcome and definitely it gives you one thing for sure. So this is what PNS is adding. Now, what does what what more can you do with caudal portal? Take a 19 gauge epidural, give it as you're giving a single shot caudal. Dilate if you want with normal saline, not necessary, but just that it becomes um, easier to thread a catheter. And this becomes a portal for your catheter insertion. And the tip of the catheter can be kept at the surgically congruent vertebral level. So this is what caudal portal can be used by just landmark or PNS guided. We do have caudal um, stimulating catheters as well, even epidural stimulating catheters. But in pediatrics, it doesn't really work in a cost beneficial manner. So one time ultrasound would is, is probably a better option to go to. Now, let me introduce you to the world of ultrasound and neuroaxial blocks as such. If you want to really understand ultrasound spine, and if there is any one place to start with it, then come to ultrasound guided um, central neuroaxial blocks in infants and neonates. The anatomy shall be so open that get this anatomical concepts and go to your adult practice, and it's going to really aid you understand that difficult anatomy there. Here, the anatomy is easy, but you need more dexterity to work at that superficial level. So, well, let's go ahead. So, this is how it would be. I am just showing you the probe movements. It could be straight. When you want to do a longitudinal scan, you may not be parasagital as such. You may not be or you could be, but here, remember, we just realized that the ossification hasn't happened, so you can be bang on the spines, or you can go a little ahead, a little, little lateral and turn inside as it were to look through the laminase inside the central neuroaxial conduit. You could do a transverse scanning as well. So this is how you can slide your probe up. Actually, the orientation marker doesn't matter here because you are going to really... not give a peripheral block, it matters there more. You're going to anchor as posterior and anterior more than lateral and um, medial. So this is how you will scan. Now, let us, let us look at this perfectly because if you want to understand ultrasound central neuroaxis, this is something that I would, this is that one video that I would want all of you to realize, understand and go back. So go back in the sense, yeah, you stay at home. But this is one thing that I really wanted to percolate in you. You've seen the probe. Now you see what the probe shows you. So here you go. Anchor, anchor, anchor yourself. Posterior, anterior. Orientation marker, longitudinal. Be sure the orientation marker is caudal. Want to keep it careful at? Keep it careful at. As long as you know where the orientation marker is, you're fine. Now let's go ahead. Here is the skin and subcutaneous tissue, understandably very, very thin. Then you come to another way. This is this is a, the, you know you can see all this. this. These are these are all white lines, right? So this is the phylum terminal. 
let me not jump to file them terminal let me go layer by layer with you all can you see this one two these are all sacral spines and this this is a sacral spine as well is it really hindering the posterior dura here no it isn't so these are this is the posterior dura this is the roof this is the floor again these are the sacral vertebrae so here is your roof here is the floor of the sacral vertebrae and this is the caudal epidural space where you are going to work in these are the phylum terminals and here would be somewhere the sacro coccygeal ligament not really uh, can't really pinpoint it but this is how the needle will get in and this is the csf so if the needle goes further down and really gets into here then you would you are you are actually creating the most most deadliest complication of caudal epidural which is a total spinal in other words so anterior dura posterior dura and this would be the anterior epidural space and this would be the posterior epidural space so having told you this let's go ahead and see the video even further let's we are descending up can you see this this is full of liquid so this is csf the posterior dura the anterior dura could you see the hyperechogenicity here this is the ligamentum flavor and this could be the epidural space let's be a little more diplomatic and call this the posterior dural complex as such because it's very difficult to really say where the ligamentum flavor has ended and where the posterior dura has really started and where is the epidural space in between the two Uh, when well, once the drug starts percolating it is going to peel both of them away but still most likely these are the two structures which are pretty different and we can say this at least to some certainty in this age group once they become adults impossible we politically correct there and call it as the posterior dural complex this is the anterior dural complex so this is the anterior dura and this is the, these are all the, the the longitudinal ligaments and this is the posterior aspect of the vertebral body so this is very clear this is the central glial tissue now let's go ahead you can see the central glial tissue you now we are in the lumbar region as it were and can hold hold on hold on let me hold this video can you see another cone as it as as it is here this is the conus medullaris so now you can even see where the actual spinal cord has begun now let's go ahead and see that now, now let's trace it ahead even further we go ahead watch the conus medullaris let me ask you all are these ultrasound videos very clear to the audience here it's clear yeah, yeah, yeah. okay 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 lovely that that's very reassuring now let's go ahead go ahead in the sense we are going cephalad we are going cephalad even further trying to be very sure of the corners again now we are back at dural sac so so we 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 got the entire idea of the dural sac then the conus and then how the the whole thing proceeds let's come to the transverse section before we really go to inter interventions as such transverse sections in a baby a very small baby is going to look like this not a very good image let me go a little ahead and and get get the image for you yes let let me hold this one let me hold this one this is the posterior this is the anterior can you see that there is a little loss of image because the the footprint and the skin are not in contact the child is a little small and the probe is a little uh, little the child is a little big and the probe is sorry the other way around the probe and the skin aren't sitting with each other okay the probe is in the air but some part of the probe is really sticking and giving us this image posterior anterior of the body can you see the two sacral cornus so there is a slight shadow of the sacral cornu here and here but not much and now you can see the sacral coccygeal ligament which is for sure a structure which actually a needle is going to traverse through this is the epidural space the potential caudal epidural space and this is the base of the sacrum another dreaded advantage dreaded complication of an intraosseous injection in other words intravascular injection is this if the needle goes through this here and is uh, then you obviously are are going to head for trouble and sacral osteomyelitis of course so here is the place 
where our drug deposition is going to happen you will see this as if it's been it, it, it's it's been tethered by the needle and then you come inside and start injecting the local anesthetic you can see the hydro dissection happening here so now let's go ahead and can you see these can, can you see the nerve endings they are they are the ones this is another typical frog sign sacral cornu sacral cornu the loss of image is a little less this is the potential epidural space this is the base of the sacrum have it sink in your mind this is the pattern which you are going to see now we are going a little more ahead we are going in the sacral area this is the sacral area still sacral area let's go a little more ahead let's go a little more ahead now this is still higher sacral area the bifid spine is here but we are getting the formations of the conduit yeah now we are almost in the hold on we are let now we are we are in the lumbar area as such so can you see the entire spinal cord let's go a little ahead and freeze here a little more ahead wait let i would i won't let you go till you see a proper yes yes let's halt here let's halt here and ponder on this image even further posterior anterior this is in between the two spines even if it was on the spine you would have seen this however if you want to choose a space to get into or want to watch a space that you want to you would count and be here so this would be the posterior anterior this is the entire intrathecal space and you can see the edge horns here and you can see the formation of the nerve roots here can you see them and you can see actually the dentate ligament then you can even see the lamina actually this is the lamina and if you go a little ahead when you are in between the two spines you see the transverse process if you are on the spine you always see the lamina here it looks like a lamina la minor view yeah here is the transverse process view a proper transverse process view now you can see that these are the nerve roots the horns in between the intrathecal space this would be the ligamentum flavum and this would be the dura sorry the ligamentum flavum is somewhere here and you you would get your drug or the epidural catheter in a transverse section as if it was a hyperechoic dot right here and these are all the nerve roots that are about to form and exit from the foramen so this is how it would be as you go higher up you would see that the lungs are moving around you would see the pleural movements can you see the bigger nerve roots forming yeah now we are coming higher up we are ascending into the thorax and you will start seeing the movement of the lungs now this has changed a bit the matter inside is more in inside the intrathecal space and the nerve roots are seen here and you can see the csf cushioning the intrathecal space this is the intrathecal space this is the csf here okay so this, this this is actually the beauty of central neuro axis ultrasound this is again the dentate dentate ligament can you see how it is holding properly the entire structure so that's a good scaffolding formed here so this is the this is the image or this is the video that you really have to sink inside yourself if you want to understand the process of central neuroaxial blocks let's come to the interventions if you want to really teach ultrasound or follow somebody doing it with a landmark so this is the dural sac we are very sure about that now this is the needle approaching in a baby yes we are actually we have dilated the anterior epidural space with the drug and there was a wee bit of air in the hub of the needle which sabotaged the image 
these are all teaching videos you one can go very very close to the dural sac ask them to withdraw and then inject a little bit has gone on the posterior dura as well so it becomes a bit tricky when you're teaching in neonates especially for a person who has just come to learn with you so they should be a couple of um, months in infants and older children so let's go to the older children so this is the phylum terminal again roof and floor of the sacrum see how the anatomy has beautifully changed the depth has changed we are working at 4.9 maybe even a lesser depth would have been okay now the injection has started and you will see the posterior and the anterior dura coming together because now the drug is seeping all along the drug is posterior to the posterior dura and anterior to the anterior dura now see the posterior dura when the drug reaches here you will see the posterior dura falling and the anterior dura coming towards the posterior dura so the anterior dura gets lifted the posterior dura gets depressed okay pushed down so this is what is the seepage of local anesthetic in the central neuro action looks like and if you can see this at the surgically congruent level you are very sure your block has reached there or your local anesthetic has reached there so go back to the pns side pns video told you that you are in the phylum terminal and that you would go inside the csf and get it at a lower current now this video is going to tell you that it is a surrogate marker to be sure where you are and you're not just sure of where you are you can be at the surgically congruent level along and if you aren't you can dilute your local anesthetic a little more give it or see after some time because it it's it's a pulsatile structure and it might carry a little ahead more than that you can actually see the catheter tip if you have given your block a little uh, you know with this exactitude you can actually get the surgery done in a very very lighter plane it's a vasectomy done for a high creatinine level and and look look at the surgery uh, the anesthesia depth as as it were the child is just given a whiff of sevoflurane as it were for immobility and the operability is is given by the regional block the caudal epidural if you scan a lot you realize that in prematures the dural sac is even more close so please be very 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 sure very 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 sure of coming into prematures and neonates only after you have practiced a lot in older children and infants well coming to the volumes we get our caudal blocks on volumes lower limb and penile 0.5 ml per kilogram herniotomy don't underestimate it's not below the umbilicus it is actually lower thoracic go to 1 to 1.25 ml per kilogram because the dermatome is that way lower thoracic again 1 to 1.25 ml per kilogram and please note the concentrations we have decreased the concentration so let's reflect on what we have learned how do we assess that the action is truly on anybody on the chat box can they can can they just put it across or anybody can just open and talk to me how how i mean we've given given such a block so how how do we how do we make sure that there is it's acting still and how do we know that it's acted yes no increase in heart rate following yes wonderful yes wonderful anal sphincter loss yes yes anju yes this is all provided you know don't, don't give up on your block unless you have given a soakage time to your pediatric surgeon unlike orthopedic surgeons pediatric surgeons are going to scrub and come and stand next to you while you are going to give a caudal block so Uh, give your soakage time, and if you haven't, then make sure that the depth is adequate when they take an incision, and let the caudal pick up for post-op and anesthesia, or as they go further, because hernias and circumcisions are very short operations. Slight increase in heart rate, yes, possible. So give a good um, soakage time, and there should not be any increase in heart rate and blood pressure. And yes, pupils is another way to understand that there is a response of. again after this and secondly if you've not paralyzed the child then slight motor movements are also 
seen or increase in respiratory rate. What do you do actually when there is a blood or CSF tap? Yes, pour in. There is a blood tap. Now what do we do? Yeah, we would prevent it, but it, it's uh, even if you use ultrasound, you may get blood taps. Let me tell you. Very small vessels may not be still seen. So what would you do? What should we do? CSF tap, we shall abandon the procedure, I guess. I would abandon the procedure if I get a CSF tap body. Blood tap, I would redo it. But I would, if the local anesthetic gets a tinge, I would throw the local anesthetic and do it again. How do we communicate with the family about a caudal? Adjust the needle tip, yes. Remove and take, take a new prick. But multiple pricks also can give a gush of, I mean, not, not a gush, but a tinge of blood. How do we communicate with the family about a caudal block? Any, any clues? Any suggestions? Reinsert flushing, okay, yeah. And watchful of last. Yes, I get that. Okay, let me let me just share with you how, how we communicate with our um, patients when it comes to a caudal epidural block. If they're mothers and if they've taken cesarean section spinal or epidural, they have that conditioning of, okay, it goes right, in, right inside the spine. We have a very uh, kinder way of putting this to them. We say that your baby will be sleeping when we give this caudal epidural block. We we say that this epidural is totally different. In children, the space is very, very low down. When the whole back has, you know, the spine has ended, it's just underneath the skin and we are, it's not too deep as it was, as it is in adults. And we would give a numbing medicine through it which will numb the area of operation and your child is going to be more comfortable. And I always like to give them the example of, of a dentist injecting in and around, and I mean, around the nerves where the whole area gets numb. So they identify this with, this with that mm, simile a little more. And most of them are extremely comfortable once this is, this is told to them. Well, should we really go, should we be going peripheral? Yes, modern pediatric anesthesia is asking you to go more and more peripheral with regional techniques. Agreed. But then, after having looked into peripheral, please make sure that um, it has to be a case-by-case -case decision. Let me give an example here. Ilioinguinal iliohypogastric is a good block for hernia. However, caudal gives a good block as well. So which one would you pick? If I want operability from the caudal, I, I mean from the from the entire block that I give, I go to caudal. If I want post-op analgesia, I will go to ilioinguinal iliohypogastric. If a neonate, you inject no matter how little a volume, neonatal hernias are extremely tricky. You flood their planes, you mess up with their planes, they are they, they are going to take, they are going to be flustered while working, and a flustered surgeon is not a good idea at all. So don't tamper with planes of surgeons, but if they are comfortable, go ahead or give it post-op. Coming to common complications, I guess we just have discussed. Last is one complication, and then common co commonest complication is pleural punctures and giving the dose that is calculated caudal block inside the epidural space. I mean, inside the spinal, inside the CSF. So these were other ways of um, assessing analgesia intraoperatively. Look at this one. Look at this case. Leprotomy. Baby extubated just on oxygen for transport and epidural catheter. Can somebody observe something and tell me? One observation from you all. I give, give you half a minute. Give me one observation of you. Not half a minute. I'll give you 20 seconds. Motor block of lower limbs. Anju. Yes. Okay. Anju, you're not going to answer. <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, yes, that's a that's a caudal epidural lumbar working and lower thoracic as well because we would put a tip 
for a laparotomy at the level of higher than T12 for sure. Caudal catheters, we've seen the videos. Yes, you can go more and more site specific and they can be traced. So you can see the catheter tip here. I think I'm zooming in. I'm trying to get the zoom out. Well, anyway, I will go to the next video. You will see the catheter moving up in the posterior epidural space, the anterior epidural space. It is free to move wherever it wants to. We are able to see the catheter. Though. Yeah. Now I'm going to, I'm trying to stop this video so that I can go to the next slide. Okay. This is an interesting situation where I tap to go ahead and it only zooms. So I need to get out of the zoom and I need to go back to the video. And now I go to the next, not bad at all. So yes, ultrasound does improve the accuracy of your placement. We do avoid a lot of um, deep anesthesia and artificial airway when it comes to surface surgeries, mind you. But then what if, you really are presented with such cases, such as an absent sacrum, but child is for lower extremity, or you have an absent sacrum, but it's a bilateral ureteric reimplant. What do you do for all this? Well, if it is a lower extremity, you can actually go to go to peripherals. You actually can go to peripherals even even without this. You don't need a reason to go peripherals, provided the indications are good. So come. Coming to lumbar epidural, this is another common block that we can master and there are certain differences. You use a proper equipment, here is 19 gauge and the LOR is typically taken up with a saline filled syringe. So this is how we would go. Watch the steps because not all, everything can be actually vocalized. So put a normal saline filled syringe along the dominant hand holds the needle, the non-dominant hand always gives up pressure on the plunger and then it, it's, it is moved as an entire assembly. It is a good idea to have somebody give a counter, gentle counter pressure from the other side so that the back doesn't move much. Once you have elicited the LOR, please be kind to yourself and put in the introducer because this gauge catheter is very difficult to thread without it and then thread your catheter inside. But the the fun is when you remove the needle, the catheter tends to tends to, you know, withdraw a little, a couple of centimeters. So do opposite actions. Remove the catheter and remove the needle and insert the catheter. So you do get finally the amount that should be kept inside. So here you are. Be steady with your hands and have the catheter there and then dress the thing. If somebody a couple of levels up is watching the epidural, so you need two people here, one to give and one to watch. So this is how it would appear in a transverse section, but this can be done later after giving an epidural as well. We know the transverse section now. So here's the CSF, here's the posterior dura. Here's the tip of the epidural catheter, this one. And this is the ligamentum flavor. And here is the LA deposition, a pristine, hypoechoic or rather anechoic spread out. Now, we, this is time to go N-O-R-R-A, Nora. 
regionals can be taken in the wards for different purposes. So here actually is a case of necrotizing fasciitis and she required, she, it was of course very painful. Maybe whatever vasodilatation given by the block helped, but repeated dressing was something. So we kept the catheter for quite some time, almost 14 days with a good antibiotic cover. But then of course, parents, surgeons, the whole team, and us, with the responsibility, has to be, you know, we need to take that step, a proper consent, and the entire team has to be on board. And then you can do repeated dressings. But mind you, even if they are pain-free, they are not going to really like uh, somebody very close to them. And doing this, they're just going to be fearful watching what is being done. So please, please see to it that they don't watch all this in the wards or even in the OT, minor OTs. So do this and then get going. They'll be a little more comfortable. Coming to upper extremities, we'll go to the axillary block, the most common entry-level block in even children. And indications are also of that kind. Crushes of the uh, crushes of couple of fingers, but if it's just one or so, uh, then a ring block is good enough. But crush injuries are most common and axillary block is common as well. This, this is how it would be. Uh, th these are the more end motor response, the highest level in the axilla. You see the position and then get, get in with the PNS. You want to really work with ultrasound. This is how it would be. The probe and needle position is right in front of you. This is how the entire neurovascular bundle would look at say 12 o'clock to the artery would be the median, 6 o'clock to the artery would be the radial, and maybe 2 o'clock to the artery would be the ulnar. I really will not spend much time in desipering each nerve. I would simply do this kind of an injection. We have learned from the basics that blocks really percolate very well in kids. Unlike, look at this video, it's an adult. And see the differences between the neural tissues and see the difference between the artery. Well, coming to uh, intraclavicular, the most indicated block, actually, if we are really um, dealing with congenital anomalies and, of course, supracondylar fractures, especially the open reductions, a good block for them. Again, there is a controversy for that. We'll come to that a little later. Probe orientation is here. The needle orientation is here. And this is the sono anatomy. This is an adult and this is a baby. So you can see the drug deposition all around. Pectoral is major. Pectoral is minor. This, this is the neurovascular bundle. You can see that this is the pleura here. This is the artery. Then the lateral cord, the posterior cord and the medial cord. Well, so coming to dual modalities, yes, if you want to teach dual modality, as long as the sonar anatomy is clear, dual modality has no role. But yes, you can start teaching the two people this way for sure so that they understand both the modalities. And this is the typical end motor response. But in children, what we use is the porocoid approach. We do not talk in terms of the lateral and the medial because the more medial we go, the more are our chances of functioning the pleura. We always talk of infracorocoid, um, infraclavicular block, just subcorocoid. How do we palpate a corocoid? Even in a chubby child, corocoid is very easy to palpate. Start from the humerus and come midway and till you go to clavicle, you are going to meet the corocoid bone in between. You would, there is no doubt, use a thumb which has a bigger surface area to palpate that. In any age group, of any weight, corocoid can always be palpated by this technique. So it's it's a wonderful block, and it's it the anatomy renders itself perfect by um, for catheter fixations. I'll just show you a quick video, and we go ahead. Doctor Edward, you'll have to tell me about the time because I get carried away, so that I can skip. Please, please carry on, Mama. We can take extra time. No sure. problem. Thank you. So these are the these are the various injections at various locations. So you, you can see the lateral cord getting bathed and I'm going towards the medial cord. One more question. I'm asking myself, was it required to go there? Actually not. Go to the basics again. LA percolates in small babies very easily. There are no thick tissues here, supple. So even one posterior injection or lateral injection was enough. Adult population, well, the literature is shouting hoarse. 
go to the posterior cord deposit all your drug at the posterior cord to increase your the the efficiency and efficacy of the block intraclavicular block does it really hold true in kids no look go to the lateral cord it's fine do not traverse right till the posterior cord the pleura is right here so these are a, these are two babies and here is an adult look at the adult look at the look, look at the depth that you work at you work at higher depths in babies you work at lesser depths but then the pleura is very close so so well i i it's very difficult again to 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 put everything in words what i'm trying to tell you is different sets of understandings are required for different age groups and this is a typical tunneling that we do you will have to tunnel catheters in babies if you want to keep them because they are very wriggly and they're not going to take care of it as adults would do in fact they would do everything to take it out so if you want to see a tunneling typical video this is how a tunneling would be done so please note where your entry point is this is the cephalad and we have this is the notch this is the neck here and we this is how the needle is being put in we do this very very common for forearm surgeries in children especially infants remove the stillet now thread the catheter it is an aerial view if you have noted be very mindful about this otherwise the whole catheter can come out or there could be knots at the lateral end and now the whole catheter gets its skin cover but see to it that there are no acute turns otherwise your infusion pump is going to stay pregnant in the sense when you put the elastomeric pump here it is going to get very difficult for it to deliver the local anesthetic maybe at 3 ml or 5 ml whatever you have decided at if there is a kink here this is what i'm trying to show you so let it be kink free let let let, let it let the lumen not be jeopardized anywhere yeah so this is how you would set up an infusion this is how you we would put up catheters how we would put up catheters take a, take a two he needle and and just be at the lateral cord i do a hydro dissection and go ahead well now how about this particular block it has come into vogue because of ultrasound prior we wouldn't do it because the pleural dome were right inside the neck but the supraclavicular block is really now rampant in children a very easy block and this is how you put the probe and the needle and now you can see the subclavian artery and we would see the drug deposition clearly we do not go at the ulnar pocket we do not we just see to it that we are in we are not inside the fascicles that's all we do not really bother going all around we just look we, we just take one point and inject at that that's enough in babies interscaling we do not have many indications let me tell you unlike adults but if there are indications that real solid indications because there would be a sick child with a septic shoulder well this in in these cases you truly can circumvent general anesthesia here by simply holding a mask just make the child quiet give a quick interscaling calculate the dose well 3 kg nothing more than 1 ml is required and if you want to see this video here look at the heart rate going the the artery is going to tell you you will not know really where the subclavian perivascular has begun and where the interscaling has ended in this age group put 1 ml and you're going to get your block and the whole surgery can happen only in that reflections which blocks are common i just told you the forearm the hand and the elbow blocks are common which cases would be for catheters you can add additives but catheters are for those which are extremely invasive surgeries and the pain is going to linger for a long time such as such as maybe radial club hand repairs this are this is the only catheter this is or very very bad elbow open fractures dosages we know now tunneling we have seen coming to lower extremities let's come to sciatic nerve block and femoral nerve block sciatic nerve block pns wise well it we were very very comfortable with this as well pns is 
lithotomy position simple now let's go to the anatomical landmarks greater trochanter ischial tuberosity go right at the junction of it otherwise from there Law, draw a line towards the popliteal triangle, the apex of the popliteal triangle and the line drawn from this point. Divide into three, come to the lower half of it and or anywhere along with it and do, give your sciatic block. We do not chase numbers in PNS guided. We stay at say 0.5 or even higher. We, we can come lower down just to be sure that we are not inside the nerve but it's not that we don't give the drug if we do not really get twitches at 0 0.5. 0 0.5, 0 0.75, even one we do accept and we give blocks in kids because tissues are supple. Coming to ultrasound, could be dual modality or could be straight ultrasound. So ultrasound has really changed sciatic in a very, very big way. Catheters are very, very common these days for complex surgeries of the thigh. Uh, sorry, at the ankle, thigh came in my mind because I was supposed to complete the tunica. So this is the sciatic posterior of the body, anterior of the body. This is the biceps femoris. This is the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And here is the sciatic nerve. Here comes the needle, drug dissection, LA deposition, any echoic shadow. Go on the anterior side of the nerve. Go to the posterior side of the nerve if you want to. Otherwise, one injection is going to kind of have a good spread. Now, how can you use this for your benefit? This can be your background for your catheter insertions if you require a catheter if the surgery is that invasive. So, this can be an epidural needle, as simple as that. So, once you use it with the epidural needle, Thread in the catheter. So here the catheter comes out. It all can be observed very well. Go with the catheter inside by three or four centimeters, and that's all. Even four centimeters is not required. Turn the probe, flip it longitudinal. You will see catheter and then the, the longitudinal needle as such. This is again one another sciatic example. This is what I meant when I say that you can see the longitudinal sciatic nerve. And then you can see the local anesthetic all around. So these were a couple of examples of sciatic insect injections and uh, catheters. And this is another example of catheter. Now we are on the posterior of the nerve. Does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter for the success. You can be at, and the, on the anterior as well as the posterior aspect. It was just for the visual impressions of for you that what you would see if you want to put cat sciatic catheters in children. Do I really bother for the end motor responses if I can see the sciatic nerve? And do I really uh, do I do I really bank a lot on PNS to begin with? If you are put in congenital anomalies where you're working with arthrogryposis or you're working with say club, you know, the frozen ankles as such, you are not going to get much movements at the ankle and at the toes, anyways, with PNS. So PNS was something. The failures, not, not failures, but the, 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 what should I say, the predicaments of, of PNS is what pushed actually me at least towards more and more of ultrasound. So let go of the end motor response. If you are very sure of your anatomy, sono anatomy, and you can see the needle there, even if, uh, if, even if the PNS stimulation doesn't come concomitantly, give off your blocks. I'm saving time. Uh, having said that, Yes, uh, you know, there, there are certain googlies and congenital anomalies which can flummox you. You will come to see that there are certain muscles which are actually atrophied and they, uh, they actually can look like nerves on transverse section and confuse you there. So there are two and fro's thoughts and hence regional anesthesia remains interesting always. So let's come to femoral nerve block. Well, Landmarks are the same in adults, palpate femoral, art, femoral artery to be sure that you're not too close to it. So in vinyl ligament, the lateral junction of lateral one third and the medial two third. So this is how, and the quadriceps contractions of the patellar dance. Well, if you need, get knee contractures of this kind, ultrasound would be a good option. Ultrasound is a good option anyways. So this is how you would see this is the lateral, this is the medial, the anterior, the posterior, the skin subcutaneous tissue. This is the iliopsoas muscle. So this is the fascia 
iliaca and this is the fascia lata above it so and this is the femoral now femoral artery and femoral vein you can take up epidural needle and go ahead catheterizing it as well go ahead put a catheter in there coming to rectus sheath and tap so they're very very easy blocks so this is the rectus this, this is how the needle and the probe orientation is this is the this is the this is the rectus belly and this is the posterior rectus sheath where the needle the needle has to reach and deposit the drug mind you this is the peritoneum and this is not even few mm so be careful so this is how the drug would be deposited now let's come to taps they are very easy and they are very helpful in laparoscopic surgeries as such but mind you as the wall blocks are wall blocks as the name says no visceral analgesia here so let's look at the video here one and two and three layers so this is the transversus abdominis and this is the internal oblique get in with the needle and peel away the fascia don't do anything to the muscle because the mus if if you bloat the muscle it's going to cause pain peel away the plane peel away the plane open the pain yeah so that that is the correct injection now let's come to ileo hypogastric and ileo inguinal confession not my everyday block because my surgeons um kind of you know they don't like their planes to be disturbed so this is the ileo inguinal ileo hypogastric go near it a couple of blocks so this is another day to day block a ring block we use it very often for circumcisions in fact in neonates this is where we can be almost circumvented gentle anesthesia warm ambient temperature of the ot wrapped up in warm nice cloth warm dextrose or warm 5% dextrose or warm sugar water and then let them suckle on it and then give a good ring block by a very small needle well calculated dose by if you want by the surgeon but let the surgeon wait till the block picks up i've made you imagine this scenario but this is this is actually not the baby but calculate the drugs and do all this and let the suckling on the sugar go on and you can actually circumvent the uh, general anesthesia totally so this is a ring block come to penile block so this is the, this is how we palpate pull the penis a little lower down above here is the pubic symphysis an area opens up here go straight you're going to get a give of the fascia there the pubic fascia and then 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock this can be done with ultrasound as well local infiltration a humble local infiltration can be done even after a hernia surgery and is going to give you enough analgesia in the post operative mind you will never give you operability now let's come to the newer blocks as such dr edward do i have time do i stop no oh, madam you go on we okay. can take the three minutes sure thank you so um proposition probe needle we are approaching ql ponder a bit here this is the posterior of the body this is the anterior of the body you see the skin subcutaneous tissue the external oblique the internal oblique the transversus now this is a real small baby and you can see all together you just turn a bit around if the child is a little older and then you will see the tip of the transverse process and the vertebral body ql and then psoas and esp these are the three muscles take this visual impression keep this in mind and let's go ahead we are going to see the video in different ways we are going to see different things so this is called tracing we trace it now hold on if anybody gets you know while we are working and if we get flummoxed a bit here and gets we get confused with the sono anatomy let's understand how we can make it even more clear or follow the video stay with me on the same page hold on can you see something here this is the transverse process bones are friends in ultrasound even if they cast shadows and they limit our vision they are friends in ultrasound so this is the tip of the transverse process and hence has casted a shadow for us to recognize that this is a transverse process what is this this is the body of the vertebra again a bone a friend here so what has our friend created a bunny rabbit can you see a face uh, this is the face and this is the ear am i calling for imagination please be imaginative and be with me and what is posterior to the transverse process uh, uh, to, to the vertebral body the psoas here is the here here is the lumbar plexus 
and here is the psoas and here would be the erect uh, sorry here this is the psoas here would be the ql and here would be the erector spinae carry on with the video ahead so the needle is here injecting ql1 sometimes i wonder we i think we are complicating anesthesia regional anesthesia a lot like wait wait let me complete again back to me transverse process tip of it vertebral body this is the lumbar plexus this is the psoas this is the ql this is the erector spinae can't be more clearer than this and in a baby you will realize that whether you give it to Q ql1 whether you give it to ql2 they are one and the same hardly few mm apart in a child for a pile maybe for a pile for a pyloroplasty and the kidney would be kind of you know the pylorus would be full of full with urine so this i mean you really don't have to go to all the four qls ever well coming to esps so let let me take my way of doing esp and i i feel more confident here this way look at the transverse process come to the tip of the transverse process you want to be lateral laminar go at the lateral laminar in baby sooner you will realize that it just doesn't matter where you inject because it percolates para vertebral just next let let me just pause and spend some time with para vertebral here para vertebral A, a, a real good block, and I always do it in transverse because anatomy is more easy to decipher and tell. See where the transverse process ends and where the rib begins. While giving the block, if you you can be very very clear, but in a small baby, this anatomy is really going to tell a bigger and a better detailed story. So I would rather work in this transverse process. The you you know where the you know how the probe is kept haven't you i'm actually i'm missing a good feedback from all of you because i'm not face to face with all of you so this is the posterior this is the anterior this is the transverse process this is the pleura and now 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 let us look and understand the entire anatomy as it were here so what forms the medial border the medial border is formed by the epidural space this is the spine and the vertebral column and the central neuroaxis what forms the flow the flow is formed by the transverse process and the membrane here now what uh, uh, sorry the roof now what forms the flow actually the pleura so this is this actually is the paravertebral space and the needle trajectory is going to be like this and when you actually inject this should be the pleura should be displaced down and you will never see much of a drug deposition in the actual space as place as such because it is under the shadow of the transverse process okay let's go ahead this is a this this is something that i have kept reserved because this is not a very new block as such fascia iliaca but it is of a big benefit for us especially for those surgeries which have come for plate removals plate removals in distal femurs even in proximal femurs they help a lot the only hitch in this block is keep if you want to keep catheters take them away from the surgical site tunnel them away and let them be under tegaderm and you can ask your surgical colleagues to treat the tegaderm as skin let them let let them paint and drip it so with the probe longitudinal below or about the ligament uh, the inguinal ligament you can't tell where it has what has begun and what has started when once it's longitudinal so this is the dome shaped muscle is the ilium i'm going to rewind this a little so that i describe it to my heart's content so this is the i i guess so as muscle and this is the fascia and which is being intersected by the needle it could be two he needle if you want to put in catheters this is a volume block around 0.75 ml is all, per kilogram is always at least required and what we did was we started injecting dyes to see and we did we did go to l4 vertebra is so we were going till soas but then we need to put in good volume to reach there and the blocks are these blocks are effective costoclavicula well in children to be very very honest no real big advantage as such but provided 
you get just everything in one go. All the cords are not scattered around the artery. They are on here in the artery. I, I mean, being a fan of catheter insertions in the intraclavicle area, I feel the catheters become very superficial in this. But it is a very good block. The only difference, only advantage that I can see it is oh, all the cords are together and they, they actually the drug that is given here can percolate above the clavicle. That's all I can think of. Maybe that, that, that is the only advantage. Now coming to another block, which is if, if you are a cleft palate person, I mean, we have, we, we have a long list of cleft cleft lips and palates. So for cleft palates, this is a block which has really um, really give me a, given me a lot of satisfaction because maybe they both are interrelated. I'll tell you why that satisfaction. It, pain scores are better, number one. Number two, the surgical colleagues have come and told me that these children in whom we've given this block ate better. The quantity of feed that they took is far better. And for a palate repair, if that can be a feedback, then yes, the block is really doing good. So let's go to the understanding of this block. Dr. Uh, Edward, am I okay? You want me to stop? I can stop. No please carry on. No problem. Right. So this is, the, this, this is where we need to go. Okay. So this is, the, this is the space, actually. And this is the zygoma. And we need to get inside here. This is the lateral bridge of the orbit and this is the zygo zygoma. So the, at the junction of it is the insertion point. And what is the destination? The trajectory is behind the zygomatic process and the injection point is right here. Now, who tells us the injection point? Ultrasound. Now, let's go ahead. So this is how it would be. So this is how we mark it. For understanding sake, this is what is palpated and this is the mark. That's the zygoma, zygomatic process. In lit literature, it does talk of landmark, but I wouldn't dare to do that. And I'll show you the proposition. This is the proposition. The ultrasound has to go beneath the zygoma, as it were. It has to show you that particular fossa, darigopalatine fossa. Yes. Is it very clear? This is what we see. So this is how it would be kept. And once you keep it this way, Yeah. Now the needle insertion would be from the point that we just saw. Once the need, once it starts working, this is how the ultrasound images. Sorry. So if that's the lateral and that's the medial, so here would be skin subcutaneous tissue. This side would be the maxilla. This is the maxillary artery. Let, let, let me make it very clear. This is the pterygopalatine fossa. And here is the maxillary artery. And the needle comes in out of plane, of course. And this is the whole fossa now, which gets flooded with the local anesthetic. You need very little local anesthetic to give this block, maybe 2 ml or 1 ml. That's all. You know, don't even go to, the, go, go to the calculations of ml per kilogram. Controversies, testose remains a controversy. But however, however, if we are dealing with something as crucial as a central neuroaxial block in a baby, lignocaine adrenaline gives you enough adrenaline to, uh, to work and on a test dose. Adrenaline is a good test dose in a dose of 5 microgram per kilogram, provided it is given in this dose. Nothing is lost by giving it. And if I get it, I mean, in my practice at least, I have got an increase in heart rate due to lignocaine adrenaline. So, yes, there is a controversy, as the name suggests. Compartment syndromes, there is a controversy. But don't give them a dead limb. Give them a limb which is which, which is sensory blocked to some extent and not motor blocked at all. So, sensory block, comfortable, light sensory block, comfortable patient, 
eating, sleeping, no, no grumpiness at all. With a given infusion, with a given post-op regimen, the child is fine. And after that, sometimes the child is grumpy, irritable, not looking, not looking happy at all, refuses feeds, don't do anything, call the surgeons to look into the plastic. It can be the first telltale sign of any, any, any ischemia setting in. That's how the controversy would be. You know, awake and asleep, no more a controversy. Consent, present, no more a controversy. Tell the parents, tell the child, children are very smart, they listen to everything, so may as well address them. And so these are the common controversies that pediatric regional anesthesia still faces. Coming to last management as such, this is the AORA chart. So last management, we don't have any luxuries here. No luxuries in babies and even children because they're anesthetized or sedated. So we don't we, we don't get any people talking to us in a bizarre way. No tingling, oral numbness, no tinnitus. We straight either get um, either get convulsions or we get ca cardiac arrhythmias. So the answer for convulsions is, of course, secure the airway if it is already not it, Ideally, it always is. Our mask is at least being held. So secure the airway, control the convulsions by midazolam, C2. First is airway, airway. But I'll tell you one practical tip. When the child starts convulsing, take care of the IV first. Hold the IV hand and, sh and, and then uh, go ahead resuscitating. So 100% oxygen, st first stop the injection. 100% oxygen, secure the airway, stop the convulsions by a muzzle relaxant or, or thiopentone or even propofol or worse. So, I mean, muzzle relaxant, a quick dose of scoline also. Secure the airway, control. We'll come to the decision of whether to do surgery or no a little later. Now coming to cardiovascular collapse, all kind of bizarre arrhythmias would be thrown. So please do not practice renal anesthesia unless we do have uh, intralipid in place. Please prevent it before it starts by calculating the dosage as well, by injecting in aliquots. Do not rush in the drug at all ever by using maybe um, may, maybe test doses. Yes, but a common factor is give injections in aliquots. Be watchful of the monitor. Please position children well before you start. That's another thing. Otherwise, it could be a hypoxic bradycardia and you might think that, you know, it is an, it, it is last. So not everything that happens is last. So this, this chart is telling you all the uh, treatment that is required in children, the doses, pediatric 1.5 to 2 ml per kilogram, but diagnose last with discretion. Yes, you can give intralipid at the first suspicion because there is no disadvantage of giving intralipid but if you are missing a, a flexed neck or if you are missing a, a ethnic child due to excessive or just quick bolus of propofol to be, make the child quieter because the child has in, you know just moved because of your needle prick or if you have a missed a laryngospasm which has happened due to a needle prick in a lighter plane of anesthesia and going to hypoxia for a last then I guess we are missing a big thing. So just don't get focused uh, on one particular thing. As a pediatric regional anesthesiologist, you need to be a pediatric anesthesiologist first to understand pediatric, uh, you know, the whole holistic scenario as such. And if you put in catheters, please mind you, you're married to the catheter, you and your team, till the catheter comes up. So, so I, I know this might my Thoughts are jumping, but I just want to pour in as much as I can. So we have many options. We have, um, you know, master a few basic blocks because we have a plethora of blocks and then go to the most uh, covid or the most new ones. Then choose your block case by case. There is no ideal block for one given block, uh, one, one given case. I mean, different cases need different approaches. Please tailor make it and keep learning newer things. With this, I am going to take a Full advantage of in, informing you about the pediatric regional anesthesia workshop in AORA, which is going to happen very next Sunday. So anybody wants to know anything more, you're most welcome. We can spend the whole day together dwelling into the subject. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. There's a good video to play, but I'll stop it here because I guess I've consumed too much of time. Well, thank you. Extensively covered the pediatric regional anesthesia. Thank you very much. Over thank to you. Yourself.
thank you so much ma'am it was like watching a sunday movie you have uh, gotten all the first uh, wonderful sono anatomy sono neuro anatomy it was like viewing the nerves inside from inside it was wonderful you know vinothini i was wondering i mean i i was very i i, I was concerned of looking at the participants and i was thinking whether people have logged out for their sunday lunch i'm not too sure no ma'am we, we do have uh, many people watching on youtube live and this will also be tele- will be rec- recorded yeah, no no i'm just telling you my thoughts because i i just thought that i was dragging the whole lecture a bit too much no, no, it was one let me be very honest to you this is what i thought it was one because nandini was very crisp with hers she finished bang on time and here i am going on no, no. pediatric regional is such a vast topic yeah and you had covered everything <laughs> I covered everything starting from caudal till fascia iliaca and even the pterygo palatine fossa block also so head to toe yes ma'am yes. it was wonderful uh, we all know that regional anesthesia in pediatrics is not same as in adults because from the way it is always in sedated or on a sleep child and the uh, the anatomy is quite different the physiology is different the pharmacology also the uptake of the drugs everything is different and uh, the ultrasound does definitely proves better and you had covered most of the topics also uh, the the important uh, the controversial topics also had been covered ma'am regarding the testos also uh, just uh, one uh, small doubt do we see the t wave amplitude do you have any insights on that ma'am t wave amplitude that's the most specific or whatever i i mean theory says it's most yeah specific. yeah, yeah. what i have seen is tachycardia yeah so practically immediate tachycardia yeah yeah It is, Not it many is, times, twice I have seen immediate tachycardia. Okay, so I wanted to ask that one: Is it clinically possible for us to evaluate, like we are in that side and giving to see the T wave amplitude if it's risen or? Uh, it is I know very difficult. Like yeah, but theoretically that is what is yes. Uh, fine. And uh, any testos recommended for caudal? Uh, do you do you give a small aliquot in caudal and watch for the response, uh, the heart rate changes, and then go ahead with the full dose or? It's a very is- practical question you've asked. Uh, let me just explain what we do every day. Uh, we we take lignocaine adrenaline in a dose of five milligram per kilogram, and we take bupivacaine or ropivacaine or levo whatever in a dose of two or two point five milligram per kilogram. Since we are adding both drugs, we reduce the doses of both. But lignocaine adrenaline five uh, milligram per kilogram essentially. gives us a uh, far more than 5 microgram per kilogram of adrenaline as such in it the commercially available 2% lignocaine adrenaline already gives us that okay so all you need to do is calculate both the dosages and give it so you already have your your test dose inside your syringe and give it in aliquots that's all if you are not not losing anything by practicing this however there are two schools of thoughts here some people really do not use lignocaine adrenaline at all and and that is fair too because it's not too specific but uh, if i'm getting an added advantage of a quicker block because as i told you pediatric surgeons don't don't scrub for a long time and it's very small an area for a baby they just paint and start working So, so, even with adrenaline, the block takes a little longer time than, the, as compared to the briskness with which they'll take an incision. But still, and uh, any thoughts on tunneling the catheter if you are going to place a caudal uh, epidural catheter? Uh, uh, we don't use caudal catheters unless unless it's a neonate. So, so, so previously we used to tunnel a lot. but in this nicu that i work in we do tunnel not that we don't but they take real good care so two good tegaderms and a, you know the catheter tegaderm cath- catheter and then a gauze piece and a good tegaderm is uh, is serving our purpose so we have kind of uh, we don't make it a point to tunnel each and every case in fact there there are if if there is a case we would really go to tunnel is the spica cases the hip cases where we have kept catheters and uh, they find it difficult to reach the catheters and pull them out from the so from the posterior aspect from the back so 
we get them out any places where you have where you have preferred the epidural uh, epidural lumbar epidural over caudal for the reason of infection anything anything of that sort no Or not the diaper really. on you can still have the caudal catheter in place see once they become 2 3 months we really go to lumbar we don't go to caudal portal anymore for that so that that thought hasn't really struck us a lot because we've moved on to uh more site specificity if at all i have preferred caudal over uh, lumbar maybe in a case of say urethral cream plant the bladder is more of sacral innervation but the surgical incision and working is of course comes from the lower thoracic and the lumbar more more so so maybe that is the time although the primary work is in the sacral i've gone to lumbar and you know seen to i mean with the with a hope that it's going to get flooded anyway so this you had been like the flooding of the local anesthetic you have yeah. emphasized so many times so that is a point that is to be noted in pediatric regional yes. anesthesia you need not yes. go into multi site injections yes. or any block to take up because the the tissues are so flimsy and there's lots of loose tissues in between for the drug to spread on to the end and cold vascular bundle bunda have agreed with you more there there's no requirement for multiple passes of the inject needle at all yeah. that would that increases the injury the risk of yeah that increases the risk of injury and uh, always it is uh, loss of resistance with saline than with air is it see there are there are people who use saline there are people who use air but we use saline for obvious reasons it's more physiological we do not have air embolisms i mean uh, theoretically no air embolisms no patchy blocks uh the only advantage of air is you will never miss air for anything else you will never mistake air for a drug normal saline you may you might mistake it for a drug another practical issue with normal saline is normal saline once you inject is going to come out as well if you have not have seen to how to put it you can mistake it for saline uh, or you can mistake it for csf gushing out so the, it you can get a bit confused there so i feel if we can train our minds to perceive the change in resistance rather than the laws of resistance and whether air or saline use it to the minimum that would be better yeah. this point also i wanted to ask that was my next next question the laws of resistance is always not that very distinct especially in smaller children it is only always most of the times it is just change in resistance if we yeah. Know, so yeah that is what like i have observed like i just wanted your insights on that many times it's not loss of resistance it yes. is most of the times always most of the times in especially in smaller children like change of resistance where the even if we go if we going to use air you does you don't distinctly get that uh, the air does come back yes yes actually that's a very astute observation you know when nothing you think like that uh, a child was not walked hasn't had her uh, the, the baby doesn't have a ligamentum flavum which is now gotten some pressure on it you see and once they walk and start running around the ligamentum flavum give, gives a good loss of resistance yeah. but till then it is like any other supple or tissue nice 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 thought process ma'am i didn't think in this perspective nice thought process and you know you, you know how it ha- occurs to you you go to cp children who have never walked and you will not get a very very distinct loss of resistance uh, you would better than a infant of course but it won't be as good as a equal aged person who is walking a lot yes ma'am and uh, there was a question from the viewers regarding the uh, gauge of the size of the epidural needle that you use it is 19 gauge i believe if it's a yes it's 19 but it's not a very gauge. Mm, it's on a very friendly catheter. However. That too, with the ten ml lower syringe in that, I feel that syringe needs modification. Yeah, yeah. And sure. uh, another question. But there are twenty-eight uh, syringe needles. Also, they're better. But uh, there is a uh, Payang, B Brown. They all have their cath- B Brown catheter slightly stiffer. Yes, we we have a plethora of equipments now. Yeah. Yeah, please tell me. Yeah, there was one question, ma'am, regarding like the video that you had shown about the uh, Nora, Nora in the uh, ward. 
uh, the uh, was the question is you have told about no right pedural catheter that stayed for 48 hours i guess his return no, is 48 days 14 14 days, days, days. 14 14 days. days. No, 14 days ma'am 14 yeah 14 days okay uh, his return it is so, 48 okay he's heard it is 48 i guess so did i write that how was it possible on my part. <laughs> okay okay fine that's an error on my part okay fine fine and continuous nerve block in children repeating the dose in what interval and how many days can we have the pediatric catheter in place in very small babies nothing more than 48 hours there is a logic behind that um in in very you know surgery increases the levels of alpha 1 glycoproteins so there is a cushion here So the free drug is less. This after forty eight hours, these dosages, the, these levels increase. So bank on those forty eight hours. Of course, if the surgery is that invasive and pain continues, don't pull out. Taper the dosage and see. And um, then you give a epidural holiday for a couple of hours. And of course, get in other drugs to play at that time for sure, such as paracetamol and NSAIDs. If there are no other contraindications or patches of opioids, even it, uh, I mean, do anything to see to it that the pain subsides. But more or less in forty-eight hours, surgical pain does decrease, is what we have uh, seen. So for forty-eight hours is a good thing. But please do remember: don't give a numb extremity to a child. Now they are equally disturbed by that. There is another question from Dr. Rajesh. Before using sonography, am I supposed to sign particular form, medical legally, in view of law in SDT? Yes, you will have to follow all the PCP and DT rules and regulations. Nobody is exempted from there. But it need it is not as big a pain as we think it is. Just the, we the main, maintain a register. That's all, and you can allot this work to I, I, the OT technicians or somebody, and they do it for you. We we do not have that big an issue. I mean, we, whenever we do a block, the the register is kept inside or the book is kept inside the. Uh, we have a bag as such. It it is kept inside or on the trolley, and they come and take a sign. We so we write which the patient registration number, which block, and we write our sign and the date. Okay, and Doctor Rajesh Shah has commented, "I am doing location of epidural space by attaching micro drip set to the epidural needle," and I don't know what. Yes, it's yes. I understand this logic. It is a known method, but I'm not too sure why micro set. It could be a macro set as well. Micro set might. Was a little more of a resistance. Huh? I, I tell me your practical experience, doctor. Doctor Rajesh, sure. Yeah, I would rather go to a macro, normal set. In other words, I wouldn't go to micro because micro is going to take resistance. So you might, in a small baby, you might go beyond the ligament. I mean, dura as as it were. But what he's saying is described in literature. It's a known method. I agree. Yeah, you had also talked about the compartment syndrome. That was another controversy. Like there, you have to avoid motor blockade and go ahead for a diluted uh, local anesthetic. Yes, give them a sensory blockade alone. Yeah. Yes. Or if at all motor blockade is necessary, you have to look in for the telltale signs of irritability yes. and other. Yes. But let the surgical team be in your team. They have to trust your blocks enough. and for that you will have to take some opportunity and show them that this separation indeed is possible and uh, sometimes you will i mean you just have to be be very closely knit to them and they should know you and you should know them very well thank you ma'am thank you for the wonderful lecture uh, thank, you. thank you so much and thank you nandini ma'am and uh, shali ma'am for making the sunday thank you uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, happy uh, learning day question. learned so much with from uh, फर्स्ट इज आई टेल यू वन प्रैक्टिकल थिंग 
you know there is one surgeon of mine and we work in a we work together in a very hip seven star hospital okay not that economy matters to them but i'm just sharing this with you and we started work, and i started going there uh, on because i was requested to go for that uh, for those special pediatric cases so the pediatric anest i mean the the routine anesthesiologist called me and said that you have not booked an nicu bed for post op observation after bilateral hernia for neonic when we would do it with a with a mask sevoflurane and a good cordal and um, the neonic is going to be in his cradle at home by say late evening after feeds so this is how it is that does not mean that this is the norm we could intubate we could put an lma but i'm just sharing you our practical experience that is one way of looking at it another way of looking at it is when you put in catheters say for thoracotomies now of course we have lot of bags going on for thoracotomies or cdhs uh, unless there is a surgical indication for uh, ventilation they breathe very well they get extubated even if we go and put them on ventilation they do not need sedation to that extent and of course a continuous fentanyl infusion which otherwise one would have given and found weaning a wee bit more difficult so we we are kind of uh, given giving them a lesser uh, the period of recovery is far more kinder and better and shorter when we give a reason thank you madam i i am able to understand it is a very effective reduction of the cost yes right. yes thank you madam thank you mr vishali madam and nandini madam taking your time on the sunday to present us in the plat plat platform thank you thank you one and all i also thank the sponsor akrula and our host evan rajix and the partner anesthesia tv thank you viewers we will meet the next week with a more interesting topic thank you anand thank, thank you sir thank you thank you thank you nice meeting you nandini thank you 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 th